fans. Welcome to the uh, Solid Waste Special uh, Subcommittee meeting of what is today's date? April 13th, perhaps? Yes, April 13th. Uh, I need to read. Uh, our standard opening statement I will need a motion and then Rachel will do roll call which will act well she will the the it will act as roll call. Uh, this meeting of the Solid Waste Subcommittee is being conducted electronically pursuant to Governor Bill Lee's Executive Order Number 16. I would ask for a motion that conducting this meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, public safety, and welfare in light of the coronavirus. Need a motion, please. So moved. And a second. Second. All right, Rachel, and roll call. Commissioner Blair? Here. Commissioner Dodd? Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Harris? Here. Commissioner Piercy? Yes. Mr. P? Yes. Mr. Serino? Yes. Chairman Cush? Yes. All right. Welcome to our first RFP discussion. We've, uh, what, waited uh, 18 months, two years to get to, to tonight. So, uh, Becky, I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of do a summary overview, and then uh, we will get right into a discussion uh, regarding our number one RFP on the list, which is Design This. So, Becky, take it away if you are ready. Ready. Okay. Great. Glad to have you here tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, so I want to start with just where we've been. I know that's going to sound, I know y'all are going to roll your eyes and go, golly, we know where we've been. But we've been through a lot. We've done a lot. So I want to start with where we were, where we've been. Um, this is actually a timeline. I don't know who is or isn't aware of this. Um, if you look at it, we started in 74 with the city of Murfreesboro landfill closing. I'm not sure exactly when that landfill opened. Then we went to the Rutherford County Class 1 landfill started the convenience centers, went into recycling, and then... Tell them it's on their tablet if they're not all on because it's not on the screen. It's on your tablets. It's on. It's on. Can you hear me? Let's do that. Is that better? Got this pulled up on your tablet. Is that better? Okay. Yeah, you'll have to get right into it, Becky. I'll just have to yell. All right, so this is the timeline. I'm not sure who has or has not seen this in the past or seen the dates here. Um, this is just simply where you started, where you're, you know, to the future and beyond. How did we get where we are? Um, not sure when the city of Murfreesboro landfill actually opened, but it closed in 1974. And about the same time, that was when Rutherf Rutherford County actually was permitting their class one landfill. Um, in the meantime, Several years later, you had convenience centers that started operating. Um, around that same time, BFI actually purchased the property and the permit from Romac for Middle Point Landfill. Um, started recycling about the same time as a county. I'm pretty sure that's about the same time that Rutherford Recycle started. Um, then the C&D Landfill was permitted for Rutherford County. Um, then the landfill actually closed your class one landfill closed in 94 so you're looking at your class one landfill that opened in 74 and closed in 94. that's when the host fee agreement with bfi was negotiated and that was in 1995 and basically as the landfill here closed as rutherford county landfill closed you were looking for a place for disposal which ultimately resulted in the host fee agreement that's still in place today uh, that host fee agreement started out at $1 a ton for out-of-county waste disposed of at middle point, and then it progressed to $1.20 a ton at year six, and it's still there. So that's still the host fee that you receive today. Um, in 2018, which is much, um, I'm sorry, I skipped the expansion. So the last expansion that middle point landfill had was in 2006. It was expected to give them 15 years of life. 
And then in 2018, which is much more recent, um, we know the CND landfill, the county CND landfill actually reached capacity. And that's when elected officials and different folks from the community started actually looking at different alternatives. You know, what is the solution? What, what are our options? What should we look at? Um, and then of course, I started working with you all a couple of years ago and here we are. So to the future and beyond, Initially, we had lots of goals. We talked about a lot of things, but these are the ones. I've kept this piece of paper throughout the past couple of years, and it's things that keep coming up. So this is what they are. I think the most important is that everyone in this room really does want to make the best decisions for Rutherford County, and I think that's a priority, and I think it's important enough for me to mention it. Um, we've talked about not wanting outside garbage to be buried in Rutherford County. You do want to continue receiving free landfill disposal, maintain your host fee. The one thing I want to touch on is the fact that you want to ensure Middle Point Landfill is properly closed and that's one of those where I'll say to you the state TDEC office will see that the Middle Point Landfill follows regulations. So that's one of the things that we'll look to the state regulatory agent to do whenever that time comes. Um, I know there's been a lot of concern about that. I think that's the one question I've gotten most often is what happens when the landfill's full or when it closes. Um, that's a state function. So they'll, you know, they'll continue to inspect that and keep that um, keep that facility uh, up to snuff with regulations. Uh, you want to close and reclaim the class 3-4 landfill, which is the, the uh, C&D landfill that I mentioned. You want to reclaim your class 1 landfill. And then you've also mentioned numerous times that you want to recycle and you want to compost. I think these are all pretty, um, pretty good goals for the community. I'm not sure we'll meet them all. I know that we have a good, um, good mix of proposals and we'll start talking about those in a little bit. You all have actually seen this hierarchy. We saw this some time ago. It's the same message, just a different picture. I thought the, and this is a, a presentation that you all can obviously keep on your tablet and refer back to as needed. Um, the, the words on the right, the explanation to the right side is helpful. Not sure that we always think about reduce and reuse, but those are the things that you actually start to, okay, reduce the amount of waste you produce, use materials more than once, use a glass jar more than once, that type thing, and then it gets down into disposal, which is our most common but also the least preferred, which is typically the one message you've gotten from this diagram, regardless of which version you've seen. And then we saw the actual solid waste cycle where you look at collection. So if, if you're going to manage solid waste at all, you have to collect it, you have to have a way to collect it and then transport it potentially have to process it in some way even if it's a transfer station and then you'll transport it and then you'll dispose of it. Potentially transport is something that can actually come back around two or three different times in the process. Um, pointed out here that when we looked at the actual RFI and then it rolled to the RFP, we looked at collection as convenience center, curbside or a combination. We looked at truck, train or a combination for transportation. For the processing, there are lots of options. These are the four primary that we've talked about, but there are lots of options here. This is the one category that every, R, um, every RFP actually has a component of processing in it. This is the only one that, um, the only uh, function that every RFP includes in their proposal. And then you have the landfill over on the left, which is step four. Again, I'll say to you, transportation is one of the most important, if for no other reason than your community has been used to going from local um, convenience centers straight to the landfill. So all of a sudden you're talking about, if you don't go straight to the landfill, do you take some materials to a processing facility? And then from the processing facility, those materials have to be transported in some other way to another location. So you're looking at basically from point A to point B, uh, regardless of what point A represents and point B represents. What I'll tell you is the more times you touch it, the more expensive it is, which makes sense. And so with that, I um, want to start with the functions. And what I did was I just laid out here, I'll, I'll give you, I'll go, I went back to our RFP and I looked at the highlights of what we shared and what we asked for. Basically, I've got the functions listed and I've also got the waste streams listed. And as we talk through this, I want you all to look through the request for proposals, the scoring sheets that Rachel put at your seat at your table. 
So this is a tool to use as we go through presentations. You'll have enough for each presentation if you want one. Um, you're welcome to have them electronically as well. But basically, this is what we talked about as far as scoring. We gave each of these an equal weight. The vote was to give each of these 10 points. And so I would encourage you that as you hear from each, and I'll, I'll give a, the, the plan is, and if I'm wrong, Commissioner Cush, please correct me, but the plan is that I'll give you an overview of the actual RFPs and then we'll have folks from that actually represent that company or companies that will provide questions and answers and be here to answer your questions as one, you know, as one meeting so that you get all of the information in one, one sitting. Um, but what we did was we back up in, in terms of points. We looked at this and we said, okay, each of these are worth 10 points. Well, some of you all are going to think qualifications and experience are worth more than customer service or than what the proposed facilities are. So I'm going to encourage you to look at each one of these categories independent and just base it on a 0 to 10 scale, 10 being most favored. Um, and then I left you space that you can actually take notes if you want. So when we talked about interactive community education, there were five companies that responded or included this function in their request for proposal uh, or their proposal for as a result of the request. Um, these are your five companies that mentioned interactive community education. As a reminder, we ask for the company to support the county public information officer. We ask them to provide a single contact for communication at their company, not necessarily a full-time person, but someone that we knew we could reach out to as a county to get answers and get assistance. Uh, we asked for an initial mailing 45 days before the start of any changes or any types of services they may provide. We asked for a quarterly publication similar to a newsletter, and we also asked for their support for a website, for the county website. For collection, you had four companies, and Essentially, we ask for convenience centers, which is the current model. There are 15 convenience centers, which does include Haley Road, which accepts recyclables only. We did ask them to accommodate the added operating hours, site maintenance, and other things that the mayors mentioned in the past. And then there's a small component for curbside recycling, which is the current city of Murfreesboro model. Uh, primarily, this was a consideration for new residential developments in unincorporated county areas where the density would actually feed an efficient uh, curbside collection service. For processing, again, this is the one function that all nine companies included in their proposal. This is the most diverse function of any. Um, you're looking at, I, I think as we look through the processing, there are going to be more questions with this function than any because each process is different. Each company does things differently. Um, basically, you're going to want to ask yourself what's being processed, what's being transported to or from, what's the county contribution, if any, or what's the county responsible for. Um, we ask them to give us facility capacity, which materials they would accept at their facility, county inspections, and then what is their contingency plan. I don't want to say that there, we, we hate to talk about the fact that there would be an incident, but nine times out of ten there will be an incident because you're talking about electronic equipment. And so when that incident happens or when that equipment has failure, how, does, how do they respond to that? How do they then continue operating in that environment until the repairs can be made? This is your transportation piece. I've already mentioned transportation is one of those things that we've looked at primarily truck and train because there's not really a, um, a waterway solution here for Rutherford County. Uh, but certainly truck and train are options for transport of materials. Um, again, simply moving materials from point A to point B. Um, there is a cost to this function and economics truly depends on logistics. Where is it going from? Where is it going to? What type of uh, what type of transportation is used, what's the price when they get it to the end destination or to the processing facility. Um, and again, the more times you touch it, the more expensive it is. And these are the six companies that responded with transportation options. Your disposal option is the landfill option. 
Um, it's truly, we, we know that we'll need a landfill, whether that's just for residual leftover from processing or if it's what we see now as far as the 45,000 plus tons that are generated by residents in Rutherford County now. Um, right now, relying on the landfill is the primary option. Uh, there is recycling, but there's no incentive to really encourage contamination-free recycling. The landfill reclamation, there were four companies that responded to this. Um, I would ask you on this one to look, to look to yourself to define reclamation. What does reclamation mean to you? Um, some people think, and I've had several of you all have reached out to me and I, I will say to you this, reclamation could be dig it all the way up, reclamation could simply be take the liability, reclamate, you know, what, what does that mean to you or what do you want to see as that piece or that function for this process. Now here's where it gets fun because we've talked about the functions, but now we're going to talk about which materials they, they will process or which materials they will actually put into each of these functions, whether it's collection, um, transfer, uh, transportation, processing, or disposal. And I think you have a good mix of things here. Obviously, we've only been through the functions, but you have at least more than one option in each of those categories. So I know that at some point we talked about we really wanted a lot of RFPs. We wanted a lot of re response. I feel like what we got was quality information. Um, do you feel like, again, you do have, there's no one category with just one company in it. So I think there are options. So when we start to talk about residential solid waste, residential municipal solid waste, there are seven companies out of the nine that wanted to address residential municipal solid waste. Um, it is the county's responsibility and the focus would be again residential, uh, residential waste and what's generated by residents within the county. Organics there were seven companies that also responded to this. Essentially, we said to them, organics would include wood, wood waste or brush, yard waste to include hedge trimmings, grass, climbing, grass clippings, etc. Food waste would include food rescue and or food recovery. And those are the things that we defined as organics or in the organics category. The recyclables piece, there were six companies here that responded and said they had a component or a piece of their proposal that would be, um, that would accept the waste stream, recyclables waste stream, which included plastics one through seven, glass, mixed paper, and cardboard. Metals, there were six companies on the list and essentially we said steel, tin, aluminum, and mixed metals would be included there. The BOPA was batteries, oil, paint, antifreeze, and electronics. And there are two companies that mentioned um, options for those materials, for those waste streams. Your household hazardous waste, there were three companies. Uh, primarily this is household volumes, but they are still hazardous waste, flammable, corrosive, explosive, that type thing. You all have a household hazardous waste collection here at least once a year and usually twice a year. And then problem waste would be items that take extra attention or items that need uh, to be handled in a different way than what would normally be handled. So that's going to be your furniture, your mattresses, unwanted medications, tires. We've talked about all of these things over the past 18 months plus. Um, so those are those things that, that, you know, one system will handle these, but it might not handle a mattress or it might not handle this. So those are questions we need to remember to ask as we go through the process. And then construction and demolition, there were actually four companies here that responded or said they included this in their proposal. I want to take a moment on this only to say this was the one item or the one thing in our proposal that was not considered generated by residents. But this is also one material or one waste stream that there are on average 750,000 tons of construction and demolition debris generated in Middle Tennessee every year. And so as we filled up landfills, similar to your all's Rutherford County landfill, what we have found is all of a sudden it's easy to divert that to fill up class one space. 
And so at the end of the day, you're looking at class three, four landfills, which are construction and demolition debris landfills reaching capacity. And then we have a Southern Services privately owned landfill in Nashville that's working toward an expansion. It's a construction and demolition debris landfill. They are working toward expansion, but when you start to look at the options, they're much fewer. And I think if we looked at, as we started to look at class one landfill, what should we do, what could we do, I think if you look to re increase recycling and diversion of materials from that, you obviously save airspace. One of the biggest concerns is keeping a low tip fee or no tip fee, no landfill disposal fee. But if you start to divert or start to peel away one material at a time from the class one landfill space, you're not giving up free landfill disposal. You're giving up a portion from the construction and demolition debris. Now I think there are other options for actually recycling construction and demolition debris. Um, if you start to peel away cardboard, mixed paper, metals, some of the other recyclables we've talked about for the past several months that maintained or lost some of their value but quickly bounced back as we watch the recycling trends. Um, I think that looking at those materials would also be a value. So again, you're not totally giving up your free landfill disposal, but you're starting to peel away some of the materials that um, construction and demolition debris is a lot of air. So if you look in a roll-off box and it, it's just full of, of boards and concrete and rock and different things from a construction site, um, oftentimes you have a lot of air. And that's what happens in a landfill. It takes, you know, takes heavy equipment. You actually are um, basically packing it down, but it still has a lot of air. So I think that would be something that you would want to look at. Um, again, 750,000 tons generated in Middle Tennessee is quite a bit, and that isn't just Rutherford County, but that is this area for sure, this region. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sure. 750,000 tons per year, but that doesn't have anything to do with any uh, accident plus No, sir. No, sir, that's strictly construction. We have been. <laughs> and we had a COVID clutter clean out too, so <laughs> that wasn't included. That's strictly construction and demolition debris, which would be from construction sites um, throughout Middle Tennessee. And, and Becky, did you say that did not include any residential debris? That, that's just construction, that's just commercial debris, I guess. That's actually a number that I got from the state and it's listed as construction and demolition. So I would expect there's a small amount of residential material in that mix, but not much. I think you're gonna find that's mostly commercial. That's mostly um, mostly your builders and your construction companies that are in various communities throughout the region. And when you say Middle Tennessee, is that beyond our power of 10 counties? Is that from? It's from the Kentucky the, line to Alabama Georgia line. What? It's from Kentucky line in Middle Tennessee down to you all are the furthest south. Okay. So it's that 13 county space, 13 county region. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I would like to have a copy of this emailed to me to uh, to utilize during this process. I put it together because I felt like it would be a good reference as we go through this process because it does get, you know, we are talking about a function and then what waste stream and then what company and, and I felt like this would hopefully keep it organized enough that it wouldn't be confusing. Brings up some interesting uh, opportunities there. All right. All right, so you're on your question slide. So, I am. All right, gentlemen, any uh any questions for what you've heard thus far? This was just a recap. <laughs> All right, seeing none, Becky, uh, can continue with uh, our next step. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk to you all about design this and I'm gonna ask you to please tell me at the end of this this is not a long presentation what I did was I gave you a narrative summary of what I learned or what I read from the actual proposal each of you all have that copy and then what I did was I pulled the exhibits out of this proposal because I'm not as familiar with some of this technology as the folks that actually are part of this company or part of this effort are um, we do have Mr. Snyder from uh, design this in the audience and so I'm glad he's here I'm glad he's here to help explain some of these things to us I know you'll have questions about it 
What I want to say to you, though, is once you see just this portion, it'll be your narrative with three slides of just exhibits. Tell me if you'd rather see more information on a slide, if you would rather, you know, what is the narrative? Does it have enough for you? Obviously, we'll have another meeting tomorrow night, but I want to hear from you about what you, what would be the best tools to help you in your assessment and your review of all of the proposals, because that's important. So with that, I will dive into Design This. It is a local company based in Christiana. There are actually six components to this effort. Um, it's a collaboration between Design This, Full Cycle Management, Primoris Services Corporation, Sonova LLC, Invista Technologies, and Mazda Recycling Services Limited out of New Jersey. So you're looking at several different companies. You see, um, you see the business, uh, the lead proposer again is Mr. Snyder at Design This, and then you have the full cycle management, which is the financial piece, equity financing, that would actually include the debt financing for the project. Uh, the Primoris Services Corporation, you see that they actually were in pipeline construction to start with. They would actually focus on the engineering, procurement, and construction. Uh, they would be that portion of the project. And then Sonova is a waste to value or waste to resource company. Uh, they do have a different technology than what I've seen before. Um, I will say to you, at this these are the three um, these are actually the three exhibits from their proposal this is the first one that's on page wait that's yeah this is the first one that's on page seven um, and as we start to get into these other companies these are the ones that are um, starting to perform these functions so you've got Sonova that has the waste to resource um, typically they convert all, convert all types of waste and plastics into power heat fuel chemicals um, you've got Invista Technologies which was formerly DuPont textiles and interiors um, they actually are a big producer of polyester fibers and different um, different fibers such as polymers and intermediates that are associated or affiliated with polyester. Um, production of renewable chemicals is what their component or their piece would be. And then the recycling services are truly a recycling facility. They've been referred to as a one-stop shop. In other words, um, it's a facility that could process several tons, um, several tons of materials a day, and single stream, dual stream, commingled with paper, cardboard, plastic, and aluminum. There are several references in here. Um, there's your list that I shared with you. Some of these are um, references are actually one more page back. The proposed functions are to actually design, construct, finance, and operate a MRF that would be a waste conversion facility, would process approximately 85,000 tons a year, and produce a refuse-derived fuel. Would be in a 50,000 square foot building. Required footprint for the facility is approximately five acres. The facility would employ 10 to 15 full-time employees and operate on a con schedule consistent with current operating schedule of Rutherford County Convenience Centers. Sonova supplies advanced conversion technology and its gasification. Actually removes contaminants to create stable, cost-effective, and renewable alternative to natural gas. Basically, the system begins with a biomass feeding system, which then performs gasification of biomass removes the tar and other organics, which creates the BTX, which is benzene, toluene, and xylene. No, no, um, no external power source except for turning on and turning off or powering up or powering down the unit or the system. The proposal for this facility is actually at the City of Murfreesboro Wastewater Treatment Plant. The proposal would be that it's co-located with that facility with the intent 
to supply the Murfreesboro facility with excess electricity. Properties owned by Rutherford County where electricity can be supplied would be considered alternate sites. They do talk about public outreach. I misspoke to you all. Back on page two are actually the development team for each of the components or each of the companies involved and your references are here. I apologize for the confusion. Looks like they actually have a facility that is, I thought I saw Atlanta. Maybe not. But at this point, what I can tell you is there are four chambers and it looks like it's a four-step system and it will handle 85,000 tons per year. Um, and with the committee chairman's permission, I'll ask Mr. Snyder to kind of fill in the blanks as far as technology. Um, what I've shared with you is what I actually read from the proposal. What I could see was of pertinent interest or information that, you know, considering the functions and the materials or the waste streams that we've talked about but he's the one that can actually tell us about the technology. He knows a whole lot more about that than I do. Mr. Snyder, if you'd like to come up um, and we will uh, let you uh, introduce yourself and your processes and then we will ask some questions for both you and Becky to the to the best of our ability and your ability uh and we'll, we'll take notes as well so uh, the floor is yours happy to do that and Appreciate don't it. feel bad about having your back to us you'll you'll need to speak into the microphone for might be helpful if i've got i've got some other slides that'll help explain the technology okay if that is okay uh, we're gonna let it becky do her very best to uh to do that it becky that's dangerous yes <laughs> So wh while we're waiting, uh, Mac, the, two, two times I've heard uh, 85,000 tons is the initial process per year. What, what does that number mean to you? Re too, too low for our needs? That is the number. That is the number that Rutherford County Solid Waste and City of Murfreesboro Solid Waste combined is 80, roughly 85,000 tons a year. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. We've talked in the past about 300,000 tons. What does that include? That would be the other residential solid waste that we don't control. But well, we don't control at this moment. Okay. You're, 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 are you talking about out, out of county? Smyrna. No. Oh, Smyrna and other. No, we're, we're not collecting that. That's okay. what they're talking That 300,000 tons, right, Mike? Is We're not collecting that. We're only collecting about 88,000 tons, which half of that's coming from the city of Murfreesboro. Okay. And so the 300,000 is countywide solid waste. May I jump in? My recollection is that 300 was the theoretical one cubic yard per or one ton per person annually. So, uh, Chairman, that's a educated theoretical gross. Yeah. If we decided to force every ton produ theoretically produced in Rutherford County to a place, okay. so 85 is a real number. It's a functional, real. We do it. We're obligated to it by the Constitution to deal with these 85 tons. That number actually is going to be a little higher because of the COVID situation we've been in. All right. So it really 85,000 is the minimum threshold we've got going on right now. Countywide is a $300,000, I mean a 300,000 ton estimate. And then beyond that oh, well let me let me rephrase that the 300,000 is based on our current population okay and that 85,000 includes the city of Murfreesboro right 
Okay. I may have missed that. I'm sorry. Murfreesboro only. Yes. Correct. <laughs> Murfreesboro and Murfreesboro and the county use. Yeah. Murfreesboro and the county together is at eighty-eight thousand tons, and it's almost half. Yeah. All right. So if Smyrna and Laverne were added into this, what would be the approximate number? Smyrna and, La Smyrna and Laverne don't do their own curbside collection. Right. So at this, it, at this point, that's correct. But so that 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 is collected that Smyrna and Laverne is done privately and those individual companies take it to dispose of where they choose. We don't control any of that. But we could possibly estimate another 85 to 90 because there's about that many citizens in those two communities depending on the next census. But at least, it, I think we can say safely there's at least 90,000 between those two communities now. And if the state says a ton a year per citizen, that's another 85 to 90,000 tons. That is correct. Yeah. All right. Some of which we're already getting through the Laverne and, and Smyrna Convenience Centers, but we don't know how much. Right. Jeff, you ready? All right. All right. You want to you want to present? I'll let you do. You drive this ship as you wish. Okay. Is this live? Great. Good evening, everybody. Appreciate everyone's time uh, this evening. As Becky said, I lived in Rutherford County now for five years. Uh, for the last 15 years, I've traveled the world uh, trying to help communities like Rutherford County build gasification systems to solve their waste issues. And uh, so I've been following what's going on in Rutherford County since I moved here. And, um, and what we've put together is, is what we think a, a nice solution for today and for, and for the future. You have those up, Becky? Do I see it somewhere? <laughs> a minute ago, we had a. It came up. Yeah. It takes a minute, or did we have to push a magic button? Here he comes. Mr. Chairman, are, we're, we're in limbo now, waiting. Jeff, do y'all have this same model elsewhere? We I do. know you've got a lot, a, a ton of references and, and photographs and all over the world. Yeah, there are. Does it consist of these? It, it, it does. It does. Currently, worldwide, right now, we're developing about 15 projects, a similar, very similar to what what we've proposed here. Will this be covered in your slide presentation? Not necessarily, not but this is more technical um, to, to kind of understand a little bit what the technology is. The, um, the Atlanta facility is under construction. It, it is, is and it, it doesn't use all of the same equipment that we have here, but it does use a, a significant portion of the equipment. Make sure I understood the answer was that you do have this type of facility in operation presently. At the same scale that we're talking about today, no, we have them at smaller scale in the Netherlands, which is where the technology was originally developed. There are roughly 15 projects worldwide in some stage of development or construction that are of similar size to what, we're, what we've pro proposed. Anything that's, that's almost immediately going online? Uh, immediately, no. Um, it, Atlanta would be the, the nearest term, and that's probably another 12 months out. Um, and uh, we've got two other systems that will begin construction this year that are 24-month construction cycles. Uh, so one will be in Thailand, and uh, the other one will be in Australia. Trying to get the get that up there. Okay. Technical difficulties. You mentioned Lamar County, Georgia, in in some of your presentation stuff here. They were were doing some processes processes several years ago. Uh, and I don't, haven't checked to see where they are. Do you know? I, I don't. It's a, it is one of the projects I'm not heavily involved in. Um, and again, it's a it's a gasification project there that's using some of our gas cleaning systems to get to uh, get to power. But I don't know a lot of details, Mac, about it. Okay, thank you. It 
Excuse me. Sure. Are you an officer of this company? I own Designs This. I am the owner of Designs This, and the consortium that we've put together is through a joint venture partnership to deliver to deliver the project. So you, there's five different companies, correct? Correct. Hey, d is there someone over all these five? I mean, are you have authority on these, or is this some it's, kind of joint? Yeah. So, I, so I one bell. My, my question is, if one bells out, does that mess up the entire? organization of this uh, it it I'm basically riding herd over the entire group of, of companies and so I likely won't back out <laughs> um, but uh, we've got commitments from all of those of all those companies those are all companies that we're currently working with on other projects as well in, in a lot of cases so it's not a brand new team that's been put together the team has some some history so, uh, so can, while we're waiting sure. so continuing on with that question in in your other worldwide current projects in a variety of different statuses are, are all these six players involved or, or or are there different players involved in some of the uh, yeah. or said another way have these six players done is this would be this be their first project as a group or have this has this group of six done other projects similar to this yeah, th this group is is primarily focused on North America okay and so internationally it's it's other players construction companies and others that are that are part of the team okay. all right and so for North America right now the Atlanta that's under construction would be the only US facility Correct. all right Got it. perfect Okay, so this is again. This is is this is really about the technology, not specific uh, to the proposal. But I'm happy to answer any questions around the proposal. And I wanted to focus on the technology because that's always the biggest part of the conversation. So does the technology work? What is it? Is it a black box? Is it not a black box? What is it? I'm here to tell you anything you want to know about the technology. We don't take uh, you know this is my black box, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. Approach. We're pretty transparent from what the technology is. And I'll tell you straight up what it can and cannot do. And so the technology is owned by Sonova. Uh, the technology, uh, if you go to the next slide for me. Sorry. Keep going. Here we go. So the technology, and I won't read through each bullet point, but the technology was originally developed by the ECN, which is the Energy Lab of the Netherlands. It's their equivalent to the DOE. And that's what the technology was originally developed, and Sonova has acquired the worldwide, li worldwide license for that technology. There are pilot scale and demonstration scale gasifiers still in operation today at the ECN in the Netherlands that have over 7,000 hours of, of operating history, including some pilot scale, pilot scale facilities in France and other places around the world. So the technology has been pretty well vetted at this point, and the ECN and Sonova are in a position where they, will, they provide 100% performance guarantees, uh, and they will actually put money into the projects, which is why we're able to bring a full financing package to, to the table. So again, this is really, looks like we're missing a little bit on that slide for some reason, but essentially this is really talking about what the system can, can and can't do. And so it can process a wide variety of feedstocks. And while our proposal focused on the MSW, we have projects that we're doing are just around C and D waste. We have projects that are looking at ag waste, so nutshells, those types of things. We have plastics only type of projects that we're looking at. And then we have projects that it's all mixed together into a homogenous blend of feedstock that ultimately makes it into the gasifier. So really, it's, it's very flexible from what it can do on the front end, but what's always consistent is the gasification and the gas cleanup step, and the pre-processing then is always somewhat customized depending on the feedstock. Thank you, want to go to the next one for me? Oh, there it was. Didn't realize it was a dragon. So, uh, again, on the back end, the system produces a very clean gas. It's almost equivalent to natural gas. It's very close to the consistency of natural gas. And so because of that, we can do a variety of different things on the back end. We can do something simple as make power or provide that, nat that syn gas to a boiler or some other piece of equipment that would use natural gas. 
We can make some liquid fuels out of it, like a BTX, especially on an MSW that has a high plastics content. Uh, or we can make other chemicals that can go back into the to make remanufacturing of plastics. So depending on feedstock will depend on what we actually can do on the back end of the system. Um, and so MSW is one of the interesting feedstocks. Um, and this, this system was specifically designed to process MSW. It wasn't designed to do something different. And then we're going to try to shove MSW through it. It was, it was specifically designed to do MSW, which is probably the most difficult feedstock, and then we can do simpler things with it as well. If you don't mind. This is a rendering of what a system looks like, and there's really, you know, just a couple of main components here. And so if you look in the green is the gasifier, we call it the Molina. Um, I didn't name it, um, how they came up with the names, I'm not sure. Uh, you've got the Olga, which is the gas cleanup step, and then on the front end you've got, uh, I think that's the front end, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's sort of the back end is your power island in this rendering. And so again, that back end could be power, it could be a boiler for steam, it could be um, hydrogen separation because there is hydrogen in the gas. So depending on what the client needs or the customer needs or the offtake client needs, we can customize that back end with the same feedstocks. Okay. So for those of you all that have the proposal with you, the gasifier is on page 10 and the Olga gas cleaning system is on page 12. I'm going to show you a close-up of those as well. So again, I, I won't read through every piece of this, but essentially there's two proprietary pieces of equipment here. The rest of the system is off-the-shelf equipment that we typically buy from, from pre-approved vendors. And so we've got the Molina, which is the gasifier. It's a two-stage gasifier, um, so essentially there's an initial gasification stage and then there's a second stage of it as well to maximize the energy conversion of that feedstock. And then we have the Olga, which is the gas cleanup. Historically, the big challenge around gasification is that the syngases that come out are dirty. They have particulate, they have light and heavy tars, and they tend to, like pine sap almost, and they tend to gum up the back end processing. This gas cleanup system is off the shelf, essentially used all around the world in refineries. And so we're just bringing it into the gasification application where we take out the, the, the tars. Those tars are recirculated back to the gasifier. We pull out the particulate and the moisture, and that gets us a very clean gas that is acceptable into engines, uh, into, into the pipeline, if that's what we need to do with it, or some other use. If you could, Becky. Uh, while you're on that, if you could talk just a minute about in here it was talking about uh, it doesn't use um, high temperatures like your plasma gasification stuff. Correct. So the difference in that and how it would function in our uh, solid waste stream that we have here in Rutherford County that you're seeing because you're definitely interested in it definitely you think it will work in this climate and, and what we're producing as far as solid waste so Tell us how that's... If, if I've got a slide, it's just a gasifier. If we get to that, then I'll answer any of the technical questions around that, if that, if that would be okay. Perfect. <laughs> so again, this is just a slide showing the optionality of what the system can actually produce, do. So we've got the first block, boxes, it's feedstock. Common, common denominator is the gasifier and the Olga cleanup, and then on the far right is the back end, and it's the different products that the system can make. Some of those products on the back end require additional equipment to do it, but within the gas, it has that ability to convert that gas to those other, other products, like a BTX uh, or a drop in diesel. Uh, it can be upcycled to renewable natural gas, so pipeline quality gas. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different things. Olefins is an example, which is a pretty hot market right now from plastics. Olefins are what are the base of making plastics. And so it's all in the feedstock. What we're doing is making it readily available on the back end, um, depending on the application. Here, we've proposed something simple which is just making making power at this point okay power would actually go back into the wastewater treatment plant or at another location. there's there's likely more power than the treatment plant is going to need um, I'm also in the wastewater industry so I've operated plants for years and so you know this system is going to produce somewhere around eight megawatts of electricity and so that that wastewater treatment plant isn't 
going to be large enough to use all that power. So we'll have to find, uh, you know, other than short of putting it back to the grid, which we can do. Um, we've talked, to, I've already talked to TVA, and so we there is a path to putting power back to the grid. It's not. Uh, overly attractive based on the price that they're willing to pay, but it is an, it is it is part of the part of the equation from monetizing the power. <laughs> so again, this is just a, to show the history, a little bit of the history of how this technology was developed. It's not in it's not in in our proposal packet, and so I just wanted to, to bring this up and and just show this, and I'm happy to share these slides with, with, with the, you know, if it's appropriate to, with, with the group after the fact as well. But essentially what it's really showing is that this is, has a long history of development within the technology and to get us to a point today where it is commercial and ready to go. One of the things that you look at when you look at technologies is their readiness level and the readiness level is on a scale from zero to ten. Ten being the highest technical readiness. So think of your refrigerator as an example would be a technology readiness ten. The gas Classifier is sitting at an eight right now, eight to nine. Uh, the Olga system is the same, eight to nine. So it's not quite to a ten because we just don't have a lot of systems out into the real world yet. But it's but it's been well vetted at this point from a technology perspective. Do you mind on the next one? So to that point. There's been some, some really big companies that have vetted this technology and what this shows is that this technology has already been third party validated by you know, some really big companies in this space. Uh, Technip, Caterpillar Ventures, so the same Caterpillar that you know, Tractors, they're actually an investor in the technology, uh, one of the main investors in the technology. So all I wanted to show here is that this is not uh, R&D. This is not pilot. This has been validated and this technology has been vetted by this group of companies who are all looking for you know, high level technical readiness type of projects. And within the last few weeks, the one there in the second box, Engineering Technip, has just signed a worldwide agreement with uh, Sonova to deploy the technology in, in uh, oil refineries to convert plastics back to, back to its basic format. So um, this, this technology has been well vetted. Go ahead. So again, this is just a, a modification of, of the process that you saw before. So uh, again, MSW into the system, there's a MRF. So we always have to, contrary to what anybody will tell you, if it's a gasifier, the MSW has to be sorted. We don't want things like rocks and steel and glass and inorganic things in the gasifier. They'll take a little bit, but it's not ideal. And so we'll also pull out the recyclables. So we don't have to rely on the recyclable market. If the recyclable market is down, we can put all the plastics through the system and monetize it through making power. If for some reason the recycling markets go up, um, then we have that option to, to recycle that material. Um, but anything that's organic in nature, so plastics, paper, cardboard, food waste, um, you know, milk cartons, any of that type of material will end up as the RDF and that will go into the system and be converted into the energy. What about the stuff that you can't use? Where does it go? So if it's if it's inorganics, we can't recycle it, then it's on us. We'll find a we'll find a landfill that we'll have to take it to. You'll take care of it. Yeah, yeah. This is this is a we, we you know our 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 offer is turnkey, you drop it off, it's our responsibility. A lot of it has to do with the, the, the local conditions. And so what we historically see is around 5% of the incoming is material that, that can't be recycled or put through the gasifier, <laughs> roughly. I've got a question. I I'm sorry? Go ahead. I'm cleaning the gas. Uh, what, what do you do with the byproduct left from that? There, there is no real byproduct from that. And so what comes out of that is, um, so the light and heavy tar, so kind of like a pine sap material, that gets put back into the gasifier so that we can continue to convert that so it's, it's not left. Um, there's be a little tiny bit of particulate that comes out. That particulate will end up in a landfill. And there is no water discharge from the system. So the system is a zero liquid discharge. There is no water discharge from the system whatsoever. Thank you. Mr. Chair. You, you go first. You've been trying a few times.
No, it's, it's not toxic. Yeah, it's relatively clean. I mean, you know, what you're talking about is, uh, is so the gasifier, when we get to the gasifier, the gasifier has a sand bed in it. And so some of that sand comes out of the system um, just because of the way it operates. And so that sand would end up, it's not reused, so that sand would end up as a landfillable material. And because of that, we get a little bit of char that comes out as well. And that would also go to the landfill. But they're non-hazardous. We've got analysis and data that shows. Now, if you put, you know, if something gets into the system that's hazardous and because of the temperatures we operate at it doesn't convert it you could have something hazardous come out of the system but we don't we don't generate something hazardous just by the way the process works so so your temperatures aren't super high so it, so it doesn't become sterile you know it's sterile but it's oh, okay. not high enough to, to okay. and I'll I'll get to that okay. in a second I, right. I promise you it's sterile what comes out will be sterile okay. <laughs> I was thinking that in here, and I, and I can't find it. I've been flipping through. It was so much, so much weight uh, per day and and uh, char. That's, yes, that's the byproduct that you was talking about. Yep. You were saying it's very little. I was thinking it was like tons per day, and then yeah, it's a, it's a, water it's a few. Was so many tons per day or something. And that's water usage, but not water discharge. Oh, okay. So the system will use some water. It's it's not a it's not a significant amount of water at all. But we evaporate any of that water that we would discharge from the system so that we don't have a discharge. And so part we, the we just, of just part of the process. Just process. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We have a lot of waste heat, so why not use it and reduce operating costs by not paying to, to dispose of the water? So this char stuff you're talking about goes back into the system. What you do have? So the the tars that come out of the gas cleanup system, the tars will go back into the system. Okay. The char, which is, think of it as your inorganic sand, and there's sand in the system, which I'll show you here in a second. Okay. That is what gets discharged out of the system. Okay. A, couple, a few tons a day, um, you know, again, depending on how we operate the system, it's, it's a minimal amount of material. That would go to a landfill unless we could find an alternate use for it. It could be used in concrete. Uh, it's a non-hazardous material. We've got T-clip analysis of it. It's, it's inner, inner, inert material. And it has very low carbon content to it. And so there are potential end uses for it um, depending on the local conditions. What about roads? I'm sorry? Could you use it in roads? You could use it in roads, you could use it as part of the asphalt mix, you can use it uh, as long as it has less than 5% carbon, which it does, it could be used to offset the fly ash that's used in concrete manufacturing. So it could be used in concrete as well. There we go. So I'll actually walk over to one of the slides if that's a, one of the screens for you. Thank you. There we go. So this is a, a, a picture of the gasifier itself, and it's a pretty accurate rendering of it. It is a round vessel. Um, they're fairly tall. You know, the, whole, the overall system will be about 70 feet tall um, once we're done at the top. But essentially what we have here is think of it as a double boiler. It's a vessel within a vessel. And so if you look at the picture to the left, you'll see the green section in the middle. That's where the feedstock, RDF, initially goes into the gasifier. In that section, there is sand at the very bottom, and that sand does come out of the system, and we have to replace that on a routine basis. That's part of what discharges out of the system that we would either landfill or find an alternative home for. And we also put a little bit of steam into that center section. That section operates at about 750 degrees C. So call it about 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit, 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. So hot, but not crazy. I've seen gasifiers run at 2,000 degrees. I've seen plasma gasifiers run at well, what they say is eight to 10,000 degrees. This is a w fairly low temperature gasifier, but it's a high enough temperature that we get a very high level of conversion of the carbon. So we always look at carbon conversion. So the feedstock has carbon in it, that's the energy value, and we're trying to strip that carbon out. And when you do that, you reduce the volume of material and you create energy. So in that green section, we do the initial gasification step where we're getting a high quality syngas off. That syngas exits the top of the gasifier and goes on to the rest of the system process. And I'll show you the Olga here in a second. The particulate that's left after that first gasification stage trickles down into the gray, into the pink area. 
And essentially what we're doing there is continue to add air at this point and really heat that section. So that section runs a little bit hotter. It has a longer retention time. And we use that to heat the inner vessel. So we're basically a double boiler is essentially what we're doing here. This design has come right out of the oil and gas industry. And, uh, and, and they're, they're called crackers, naphtha crackers. It's one of the ways that they make different fuels. And so this has been transitioned from that type of an application to this. And so both chambers have some, some tar or some sand at the very bottom. The outer vessel in the pink area then has a flue gas, if you will, that comes off. That flue gas would be recaptured and we can use that waste heat as well for part of the process. And then we also have the, the syn gas. No moving parts inside the reactor whatsoever. It is refractory line to, to maintain you know, heat transfer, uh, to, to, to keep heat within so we don't have a high level of radiant heat loss. What we end up with at the end of that process there is we get out 99% of, 98 to 99% of the carbon in the material. So we've stripped all of the energy value out of it and are now converting it into usable energy within the system or in that syngas to make power or something else. So would you anticipate it would run 24-7? These systems are designed to run 24-7. Minimum operating days per year are 310. Um, normally what you get, just like any kind of thermal process, is you'll have one to two planned outages a year, usually about a week in duration each, but they're scheduled and planned. During that time, we still receive material. We'll inventory it for when we get the system back up again. What we have sized the system to do is process the 85,000 tons per year within that 310 day window. So Jeff, let me ask you a question about that. Is this system modular or scalable? Yes. So let's go back to the original thought about, okay, if we were to get more cities within Rutherford County to be stakeholders, and if that 85,000 need went up to 170,000 tons, do you just double the size of the equipment or do no. two, two systems? Two systems. So we'll put a second train essentially next to it. So you'd have two trains at that point with a 600 ton per day MSW capacity. Okay. And so that way it seems like you would also have a fail safe. If you do. One, if one went down, you still have an operating process until you get one back online. Correct. And, and we envision that. I mean, we, you know, I, I live here, so I, I see the growth curve we're on and, I, and see what's going on around the area. So, you know, one of the things that we anticipate is at some point would, would have to put a second train onto the, the system. Um, and those are conversations to have early on because if that is going to be contemplated, we can put, get some of the infrastructure put in place on day one so that, you know, maybe the pad gets bigger to already, you know, to already accommodate that second train, even though that train may be five years down the road or whatever the case might be. So you just do some pre-planning on that and absorb some of that capital cost up front without having to absorb it all. Robert, go ahead. Yeah, a couple of quick questions. Uh, one, you know, you mentioned MRF, and I'm assuming that the MRF is separate from this five acre. It's on there. It's on there? It's on okay, there. That's one thing I wanted to know. And the next, you keep referring to this product being used in the gas production system, petroleum system. And, you know, I've read too many times about petroleum plants that have burned and exploded. So I want to know the safety factors built into this or if there's been any kind of problems in any of those that you've got in the Netherlands or wherever. Yeah, so this, again, this is, this is a little bit different application for it, right? So it is not a high pressured vessel. It is at ambient pressure. So it's not like, you know, within that reactor, you're, you've got 200 PSI or 300 PSI, and if something happens, it, it goes, right? So this, is amb this runs at ambient pressure, at reasonable temperatures. Um, there are lots of safety <coughs> features built into this system. There is a significant amount of monitors and probes and sensors within the system that once you program it, say I want it to operate at X temperature, if it exceeds that temperature, it'll go into shutdown mode automatically. I've not had a history and I've been dealing with gas fires for 15 years operating them myself as well. I've not had a single single event like you're describing yet. And the last thing for right now is odor. You know, I, I've been to some MRFs, and inside the MRFs, you've got some odor. Outside, I didn't notice that much, at least in the one or two that I've been to. Uh, what's your opinion on MRFs there if we were? 
trying to locate this somewhere uh, in the municipality, for instance? Yeah, so first, deliveries need to be in a building. That building has to be under negative pressure to minimize the risk of odors getting out the door. You know, once we process through the MRF and it goes into a, uh, the RDF, and once that RDF goes into the gasifier, there's zero risk of odors at that point because you're high temperature and how do you deal with, with odors? You deal with essentially heat and, 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 and to deal with any odors. And so you're certainly going to have the potential for odors at the receiving of the MSW and in that processing parlor, if you will. But again, that's all comes to design. And so we've got to design it right so that we're not, you know, a bad neighbor. The whole goal here is, is that this needs to fit into the community you know, it's kind of behind the scenes. It's not an eyesore. You don't really know what's there. And if you do it right, it can be done and not ha not be a nuisance at all. I kind of want to touch back on Commissioner P's question. BTX, benzene, terlene, yep. xylene, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Highly flammable. They are, but we're not doing that in this system. You're not going to do it in this? Nope. Okay. This is strictly power. It does not. There is no open market for syngas. You could potentially take that syngas, add a third step to the process, if you will, and purify that syngas to renewable natural gas, and essentially put that natural gas into that renewable natural gas into the natural gas pipeline. Um, it's a little difficult to do here in Tennessee, um, but you know, in other places of the country, that's like California is an example. That's part of what you do and what we're looking at in California to do is, is making renewable natural gas and putting it in the pipeline. Here, you know, our costs are really low compared to a lot of other places. And so, you know, the, the, the least expensive option and the most viable is to make power out of it at this point. Uh, if there was a really large steam user, um, and I've been looking for that steam user in Middle Tennessee for the last five years, um, that that is an option. I haven't found I haven't found the company yet that, that could take that volume of steam and, and want more of a renewable steam. And so as we looked at, you know, what are the real options here in Rutherford County, it's it it's really to make power and, and to be honest with you, it's from an economic perspective, it, it's not the best option because, you know, T V A has got really low low rates. And uh, I was a bit surprised when they told me what they'd be willing to and generously pay me for the power. But um, it, it is what it is. And unfortunately, the tip fee associated with a system like this and the price of the power on the back end are closely coupled together. So the lower the power price, the higher the tip fee. The higher the power price, the lower the tip fee. And, and it's just not here. It's everywhere. And so um, it's it, Middle Tennessee is challenging from... Uh, you know, from a renewable energy perspective. Have you checked with Bridgestone? They cure their tires with steam. They do. I've toured the plant on many occasions and over the last several years I've had many meetings with the folks at Bridgestone. There certainly have been an option. Um, they have boilers, but you'll be surprised at how little natural gas they actually use in their steam production to, to make those tires. I was surprised. I thought I thought it would be a home run, but it wasn't. Jeff, I want, I want to revisit uh, Chairman Harris's question because th that's an aha kind of a moment for me, and I want to make sure I, I clearly understand and the rest of the committee understands. Are, are you saying that the BTX chemical portion, which I, I had jotted several questions down, is do we need to strike that? off the table for the Rutherford County consideration? Yeah, again, it, yes. And we did not in, you know, it, we are not making BTX here. Okay. So, so, so guy, uh, on page, on page seven. Does it say that? It, it, it alludes to the fact the that, it, it alludes to the fact that that is a possible solution or a byproduct. It's, it, it is possible. But, okay. All right, so I'll ask it again. 
is is it still in consideration for Rutherford County or do we scratch it? We, we can scratch it. You, okay. you can scratch it. It's, it's an option. I, I That was an oversight on, on my part. Okay. So it's electricity instead of BTX. Yeah, this is electricity. So this is a, a basically in your in your eyes an electricity only yep. uh, conversion. Eight megawatts, roughly, gross okay. or a net to the grid, based on the eighty-five thousand tons. Based on the eighty-five thousand. Okay. All right. So uh, you you mentioned you know in the proposal, ideally uh, having this next to the wastewater treatment plant. If that's a, if that's an if not an option. We could we could relocate anywhere we want anywhere we want and supply. We, we, you know, as it, long as we had transmission lines and the infrastructure. That's it. We, 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 we want to collaboratively figure out where the best place to put this. You know, kind of going into an RFP. You, yeah. You look around, and I'm familiar with wastewater treatment plants and how much power they use and right. don't use. And okay. and I thought that you know it's kind of a natural fit, but it is not by any stretch of the imagination a must-have to put it yeah. at the wastewater treatment plant. It could go anywhere that has a the, the higher the load the better off for everybody involved. All right. Because uh, just between us chickens, that the, the city will probably veto that option. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's an option. Okay. Jeff, I wanted to ask you a question about further on in. Lincoln Young with Rockwood has presented uh, an RFP as well. He did. And he's in your stuff here and he, he backed out of tonight going to may something right rachel he, he'll be here tomorrow night tomorrow, tomorrow oh weekend. he'll be here tomorrow sorry the other one pratt recycling went to, the, to got you pratt okay got those twisted up there That's so right. the affiliation kind of talk to us about that a little bit uh, <laughs> lincoln and i uh, met probably five years ago or you know probably four to five years ago <clears throat> and lincoln and i have been looking at several different types of thermal conversion systems here in Middle Tennessee. And, um, you know, and so we're teamed up together to look at, at some other feedstocks as well. Um, you know, work together to try to bring some solutions to, to Middle Tennessee that, uh, you know, that he and I kind of lead the charge on. And so, you know, he has a facility in Lebanon. Uh, we're talking about, you know, the potential use of his facility up there for a different feedstock than MSW. And so, um, you know, we've, uh, for better, I think, Lincoln and I have somewhat, you know, tied our, tied our horses together and are trying to do some good here in Middle Tennessee with looking at some it's, of these It's projects. probably not a bad thing. It's just like if, if, if you're awarded part of this, then he's going to be involved to a certain degree. And if he gets awarded part of it, you're going to be involved. Yeah, so and, I didn't, and I didn't, to be honest with you, it was just coincidence. I didn't realize, and he and I, we, we talked fairly frequently, but uh, didn't know until after the fact he actually submitted and he's looking at something a little different than what we were looking at here. So I didn't see that as a conflict. I see it as a, as a, as a benefit, actually. Lincoln knows a lot of folks and knows how to move material from place A to place B. And, um, and so, you know, he's, he's going to be a valuable part of, of what we try to do. So, Becky, could you go to the next slide for me just real quick? <clears throat> so just, I've only got a couple more here just to kind of show you, this is the gas cleanup step. And this is key to the process. Without this, you've got a dirty gas and it's very difficult to do anything with. And so this is the Olga. Its only function is to get us to a gas quality that is similar to natural gas, not quite the level of natural gas. So if you think of natural gas on a BTU basis, natural gas is 1,000 BTUs per standard cubic foot. Our gas coming out of this system will be about 700 to 750, roughly. Um, depending on, you know, kind of day in, day out what the feedstock looks like because we fully recognize MSW is not the same every day or every hour or every minute. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a quench system. So there's some, some oils and some things and some cutting fluids in here that basically go in, strip out the tars, strip out the particulate, and strip out the moisture. Uh, if we're going to a, a turbine or an engine, and in this case we'll go to a turbine, uh, a gas turbine, um, they need moisture-free gas, and so that's the function of this technology. Again, it's well-proven technology um, used in lots of applications across the world. It's just being plugged in now onto dirty syngas instead of uh, you know other applications. Um, and it is part of the system. This is all one, one package. From a visual perspective, if you walk through a plant, 
you would know that you were, you know, from one step to the other, it's just fully integrated. Again, this is a reference list. This is just updated. It's been even more recently updated from what was put into to the uh, into our proposal. Again, it just shows, you know, there's been a lot of history around the development of the technology. So what we're not proposing here is, hey, Rutherford County, um, let's do an experiment together. Um, that's not what this is. This is, we're coming to the table with a commercially proven technology. We'll put the money and the performance guarantees behind it. And, uh, and provide a solution, a long-term solution. These systems, we typically design them for 25-year lifespan. Let's go one more. And again, this is just a depiction of what a system could look like. Uh, here, we wouldn't necessarily have a bio-dry area. Uh, we do something a little bit different, but it just kind of gives you an idea of what, what might be what might be, this was actually a footprint from the Thailand facility that we're, that'll go into construction this year. Just something I had handy, I pulled out of a different presentation just to kind of give you guys an idea. And so it gets you to your kind of five acre type of number. Um, and that would include all your e ingress and egress of truck traffic and all those types of things. Quick question, we talked, you all talked about the modular opportunities. <coughs> Does that have to be in the same location because of infrastructure? Uh, it doesn't, but then you lose economy of scale at that point. And so the interesting thing when you look at these systems, if we start out with an 85,000 ton a year system and pick the time, but five years down the road we have to double the size of the facility, we don't double the operating staff. You know, we, du we double capacity, but that's how you start to get economy of scale and can drive the cost of production down, if you will, by, by enlarging. And so when you decouple and say, here's, uh, here's location A and location B, now you've got two separate operating groups and you don't get those economies of scale. And so this is, this is a rendering of a system of the size that we're contemplating here. This is actually the facility that will go into construction this year. This is actually in Thailand. You can see in the upper right or upper part of the picture the tower that's there. That's actually the gasifier and the Olga system. And the building here in the front is where you're receiving the MSW. Simply has a conveyor that feeds the top of the top of the gasifier. So there's no outside storage of material. All the processing of the waste is inside the building. The fuel is inside the building. The conveyors going from the building to the gasifier are fully enclosed conveyors. And then everything within the gasification system is in, is enclosed. So. Said you. Said you needed five acres and you wanted to be by the treatment center. Is that correct? Yes. Do you have you talked to the city about this? I, I have not. Do you have another proposed site? If that does, if the city doesn't want that. What, what we've said, what we've really said in the in the proposals, here's a here's an op, here's a here's a site, a potential site. But what we really want to do is work with the county to identify the right site. I think it. I think picking the right location for this is key to get full community support. And I think it, it can't be just us picking the site. I think it has to be a collaborative effort between the county and the and the, not just us, but whoever the, the ultimate winner of this is. I think it's a broader conversation around the right location for this system. A uh, couple more things. One, and I think you've already answered this, I just want clarification. Is this going to add to carbon emissions in the atmosphere? I know you said you cleaning up 98 to 99 percent of carbon <coughs> stripping it out of it exhaust off of this system here is it going to put anything more in there so that's a that's a great question and so anytime you thermally convert anything um, there's an emissions profile associated with it the question is what does that emissions profile look like to your point point? and so in this case we're using a gas turbine, uh, Caterpillar T70 gas turbine to make power. And so that will have an emissions. And what you typically see from any combustion engine, if you will, because that's what that is, you'll have some NOx and some SOx and some particulate. Um, but it's, it's a very, very small footprint. We have the emissions data and can absolutely provide that so that you can get a feel for it. Okay. One other thing I wanted to mention too is, is and this is not something you're your company's got a uh, listed under his land reclamation. If we hire someone to dig up our old landfill, I'm assuming, and I just want affirmation, 
that we could take that to your facility, to your MRF. Is that correct or is that incorrect? No, that's not correct. It's incorrect. And so our system is currently sized to process the 85,000 tons per year. And so if you start to mine or reclaim that landfill, that will generate waste beyond that 85,000 tons that we, haven't, that we haven't proposed for at this point. Not saying it couldn't be done, but I will tell you there are lots of challenges with taking a reclaimed MSW from a landfill and then getting it ready to be processed in a thermal conversion system. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to hear from you, whether you could do that or not, if it was feasible. Yeah, we'd have to add a second, a second train and then understand how much material we're talking about over what period of time. But that will require another level of pre-processing to get all of the dirt out and everything else that is going to be commingled in that, in that reclaimed material. I've looked at this in the past. I've, I've looked at it many times, and it, it is a challenge to process reclaimed material. On top of that, one of the things to kind of think through a little bit from this type of a system is that that waste has been buried for who knows how long, and some of that energy has already been converted. It's already decomposed, and so when you start to pull it out, what I've seen historically is that it has half of the energy content that it originally started with, and obviously you're looking for that, that energy rich material to be able to make the power from. And so the economics around a partially composted, if you will, or digested waste is a bit different than taking kind of daily produced MSW and trying to process that. There are lots of different dynamics involved. So even if, even if the city of Murfreesboro waste did not come to your facility and you had that capacity, you would still have the challenges associated with the with the types of materials yes okay yes correct chanto yes sir. i when i see the pictures i just would like to see know what what part of thailand that you installed them yes. uh i'm trying uh good question i don't have the name of where that is in thailand off the top of my head i can okay. certainly get that for you all right that's yeah, another one of the projects i'm all not right. involved in because i'm you okay can't, thank can't you travel because of covid so i'm not sure is this rendering the closest that would tarp to the plant that could possibly be here this this would look pretty close this is the one that's in Thailand. This is the one in Thailand that will go in construction. It's behind right now just because of COVID. Construction was supposed to start last year. And so because of COVID, they postponed construction. So it'll start this summer. So prior to putting a shovel in the ground, are there contracts in place to take the energy that this produces? Yes. So, so the way that you look at, at any of this, um, is you know before any of us make final firm commitments right we've got to we've got to button up lots of things not just with the county but the offtake you know we've got proposals already for the construction of the facility you know we haven't done things like geotech and site specific engineering so there's a lot of work that still has to be done before you could put a shovel in the ground all of that including permits have to be obtained before we can actually fund the project so not only a contract with the county for the waste contracts for the offtake, uh, all the permits have to be in place, um, but if we can line all of those things up, which is reasonable to do, then we already have the financing lined up for this project. What if something happens to you? We're not promised tomorrow. Yeah, look, there's, um, while I'm kind of leading this, there are, there's a, there's a team here, right? So. I'm here because I'm, I live here and I wanted to, to do this and propose on this, but there are, you know, a dozen other folks that could step in and, and take my place if need be. Well, ideally they don't live in Rutherford County, I do, but, you know, you're, you know we get far enough along here, I'm not going to be the only face that you see and that you, in, that, that you engage with. There's a whole group of people that are going to show up. Engineers, operators, finance people. Unfortunately, no offense to anybody in the room if you are, lawyers <laughs> on the contracting side, but there's a whole team of people. This is not get done with a person. N not at all. One second. Uh, Jeff, so you, you, you mentioned a, a, a litany of things, of milestones that have to be completed in the design, 
build permitting process. So roughly, if we said, man, we love you, we want to work with you, are we looking at a how many month, year process before you're actually taking municipal trash? Yeah, great, great question. So I think um, the nice thing about Tennessee is permitting is relatively simple compared to lots of other places in the country but even with permitting you know getting all the contracts in place we typically tell people you've got 12 months of development if you will get all the engineering done you know get ready to put the shovel in the ground that would include financing for the project which usually takes a couple of months and so you look at a 12 month you know cycle to be ready to put the shovel in the ground and then you've got you know a 24 month construction schedule so you're talking about 30 roughly 36 months at this stage, that's what I would tell you. It could be a little bit shorter than that, but I wouldn't want to commit to anything shorter than that right at the moment. All right. Thank you. Craig? I like what you're doing. I do. But I'm concerned about the six companies. So I'm kind of harking on that, but I need... Here's my thing on that. Do you have contracts with these six companies? Do y'all have an agreement, a partnership agreement? Yes, we have a... How many years is that for? That is for as long, there is no defined time on that. It's for as long as it takes to get selected and build a particular system here in, in Rutherford County. As let's assume for the moment that um, we're successful, right? There's a whole new set of agreements that go in place with each one of those individual companies. So what we'll end up doing is we'll set up uh, Rutherford County Waste Energy Facility, LLC, and that will end up being the contracting entity for all of the contracts so all of those companies that you see in that in that proposal now will all end up with contracts to do their portion of the project with the local llc so if rutherford county say for instance sonova one of your partners yep. bails out all right that could actually be a liability problem for us now, my question to you is this. Um, would these guys sign contracts with the county in, in return for doing business with us? I'm concerned about this being multi-layered, a lot of tentacles right here. And mm -hmm. if one goes, then the county is held liable for this. Do you understand where I'm coming with it? Do everybody I, understand where I'm coming I, with this? I, I think I do. And so, so let, me, let me maybe say it this way. The county is going to contract with one responsible entity, and that entity will provide the county whatever guarantees and warranties and performance metrics and put or pays or whatever, whatever that language looks like to the county. Okay? There's one group, one entity that that happens with. Just like building anything else, you've got lots of subcontractors. All of those entities in there, while they're partners of ours, because we have already gone through the effort of, or they've gone through the effort of getting educated around our system, what it's going to take to build it, each one of those parties is a subcontractor, essentially, ultimately to the project. Each will have their own contract to that project to do their scope of work. Primoris to build the things, Sonova to supply the gasifier equipment, full cycle to provide the financing to, the, to it. Uh, there's some not listed. Munich RE to provide the performance guarantees and all those types of things. And so the, the risk if somebody fell out is, is really on that entity. And yes, it does trickle back to the county uh, ultimately because if, if Sonova, as an example, backed out, why they would, I have no idea because uh, They've already approved us putting the putting the proposal together. Um, that you know that that we're going to the likelihood of that happening is pretty minimal at this point. Um, and, but I get where you're coming from. But that's really how to look at this: is that there is going to be one role, one person, one entity that is that is a responsible party here, and all of those partners are our development partners at this stage because that's what we're doing. We're trying to develop a project. And contractually, they will all make obligations to the project with lots of different uh, performance guarantees that they'll have to make that they're going to deliver on time. They're not going to back out. And if they back out, there's going to be penalties involved. Um, but Sonova backing out, you know, they're, they're, it's hard to tell by the proposal, but um, Full Cycle, who is in there, is actually the owner of Sonova. And so um, 
the likelihood is that, you know, that they're not going to back out. All the projects I'm doing right at the moment, they're all with the Sonova technology. This is their business, and there will be one responsible party to the county. All of these folks that, that we've identified in here will play a part, but ultimately we're going to make and warrants and represent, rep, and, repre and, and represent certain things to the county that put us on the hook to perform and deliver. We're not asking the county to put up any capital. Realize that if for some reason we're not successful, there's an issue with what do we do with the garbage. But if we sign that contract that says, look, we're going to build this thing and we're going to build it by this date, and if we don't hit that date, that's our responsibility. It's not the county's responsibility. It's our responsibility. That's normal part of trying to build these things and contracting these types of projects. So if this project started and it either didn't get completed, didn't get off the ground, or failed, and I have no expectation that it would or wouldn't, but if it did, this company, this LLC entity, would then manage Rutherford County garbage however you needed to manage it, but their price wouldn't change. Yeah, we're making, we're making a, a commitment on pricing, okay. not just for today, but long term. Okay. Bill, did you have a question? Okay. Steve and then the, the mayor. Becky. Or Robert, yeah. Yes, sir. Gave us some great questions, and so instead of me sounding like this is my question, <laughs> I'm going to read this question because it's a very good question. It's kind of like what the commissioner was asking right here. Identify who is responsible for customer service response and how that communication is established and maintained. That's very, very, very big question. So that's why I wanted to read it. So it comes out exactly like that. Yeah, look, look, look as, we, as we structure the project, okay, right now I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm the lead proposer right? I'm not going to be the guy that operates the plant. You know, that's not my role. My role is to develop these opportunities. As we structure this, there are going to be people that are hired to run the plant, to interface day in and day out. Their job will be to service Rutherford County. A plant manager, uh, 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 you know, that type of person here, just like you'd see before, there's going to be lots of people behind, but there is clearly going to be one line of communication with that entity, and it has responsibility, and that person will have responsibility directly back to Rutherford County. Provide reports, <coughs> communication, whatever the case might be. I think it's pretty, pretty typical to see that. Is it going to be me? No, you'll see a lot of me in the first 12 months, and you'll see a lot of me over time because I like to be around when these things are running and I have an operations background. But, you know, eventually I move off and I go do the next one and I develop the next project. And, you know, we don't do a lot of these bids, to be honest with you. We do very few responses to RFPs because they tend to cost a lot of money and a lot of the things that we do is we go develop our own opportunities outside of the RFP structure. But um, that's, that's really how it gets set up. You know, who, who are you going to interface with now? Me. For the next, you know, through negotiations, I'll be the guy at the table. There'll be lots of others, but I'll be the guy. I'm it. You know, I'll give you my cell phone call me anytime you want. I'm fine with it. But over time, you know, there's dedicated people that get hired to manage the construction, to operate it, and those people transition to ultimately be the primary point of contact here locally. So to, to piggyback on that question, and that was a question from long ago. I was like, where did that question come from? <laughs> he, was saving, um, he was saving that. He was saving that for a while. I was like, where did that? Anyway, thank you, Steve. Um, so in looking at this from that perspective, from customer service perspective, Rutherford County will continue, or you would expect them to continue collecting convenience centers. They would bring that waste directly to you at whatever the location is. So essentially, Rutherford County is your customer or is the customer of this facility. That's right. Your residents aren't going to go there. Nope. It'll, it'll strictly be yeah, the Rutherford just County. Think, think of this facility as a virtual landfill. Collect the waste any way you want to, with whoever you want to, instead of hauling it to a bigger transfer station or hauling it to another landfill or putting it on a rail car or a truck and driving it down the highway, it comes to this facility and is dropped off. And so the, 
contractually the only customer this has is Rutherford County. Ultimately it's all the residents of Rutherford County, but its responsibility is to the county commission, county government, and the county government is going to have to, you know, is, is, is the customer. And what do you expect from them? You said no capital money. Deliver waste. Okay. Make so a long, you need a commitment? A long-term or? commitment to deliver waste. Okay. That's it. Tipping fees? Tipping fee. Strictly tip fee by the ton. And we're not talking cost yet. No, we're not talking cost yet. We have those in a sealed envelope until you tell us otherwise. <laughs> or until you tell me otherwise. Repeat that, please. I, so I have not opened the cost proposals yet because the point of an RFP is to actually consider the technology first, see which pieces of it are best as far as a solution, and then we look at the cost at the end. So I have not opened them. I, 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 I just did not open them yet. And if you all tell me you want me to open them and have that conversation as we go, that, that's fine. Um, I just need to hear that from you all. Okay, you I, hear? I, <laughs> I, I will tell you how we, without telling you pricing, I will tell you how we structure the pricing. And it is tip fee, and it's tied to power price. And so there's a tiered approach to it. It says if we get X for the, for the power, tip fee is Y. And the higher the power price, the lower the tip fee gets. I will tell you that that's the mechanism that we used. So is those tips fees, how, how are they, um, are they solid for one year, two years? Is there, is there a 10-year no. contract? Yeah, we look for a 20-year 20 20 contract. Year? And we basically say, look, here's the tip fee on day one. We agree to an escalator. It's defined in the initial contract. And we're all off to the races for the next 20 years. And do okay. you, will you be transparent with this county? Will you uh, adhere to our ordinances? Will you also be uh, available for reviews and coming before this committee every three months? Sure. Okay. I have no objection to that. Look, at the end of the day, again, the customer is Rutherford County. So as we, you know, as, again, assume you get, we get far enough here and we get into a contract, you know, whatever we all agree to within that contract, if it's to provide a monthly report, a quarterly report, if it's to come in front of the Board of County Commission's court, whatever, the, whatever it is, whatever we agree to, that's what we're going to do. We're not opposed to doing any of that. We'll, we'll, we'll share. I mean, you know, you're going to know what waste is coming through the facility anyway. It's going to come across the scale and there's going to be, you know, evidence of that and we'll be absolutely transparent on how much power gets generated. Well, that's, that's, that's a little bit tricky though because you got the county's only going to produce for you as of right now 44,000 tons a year. So the other part of that for your system of 85,000 tons is with the city of Murfreesboro. So if the city decides not to do it and they're going to stick with their current location or whatever and we're out here producing 45,000 tons or so a year you're not going to make it you're going to want to get to capacity as quick as possible so now you're opening your gate to whoever else is going to come in there to supply you fuel look we responded to the what was in the what was in the, the RP or the 85,000 tons if at the end of the day you guys say look we really like this system we don't know if Murphy, the city of Murfreesboro is going to commit their 40,000 tons to it. Get it out on the table. If that means I've got to go find 40,000 tons, there is plenty available. There is plenty available. And an option, and we didn't put it, again, we tried to stay a bit focused, right, and just look at the MSW. I can take the C&D waste and mix it with the MSW, works fine. Can take other things and mix it fine. We stuck with kind of stay down the center of the lane and not try to do too much and taking off you know biting off the MSW piece is 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 good enough right but at the end of the day if we say look yeah we, we want to do this and Murphy's city Murphy was not gonna come to the table then we either downsize the facility which would require a look at a relook at the pricing or you give us some time to go find the the rest of the waste. I'm I, I'm I'm talking to other counties. I I'm, I know where the waste is. It's a matter of can we get them to participate in a in a facility here. It's hard to go talk to these, some of these other counties and say participate in this theoretical project I might have over here. You know they don't want nobody wants to talk to you about that. 
And Just a couple of ways to go with that. You, you, I think you answered one, and I've seen some of your other projects are four kilowatt turbines. So you could scale it down. Yeah, we, we have we have two different size units. We have this unit, which is an M, what we call an M30. There's no secret behind it. What it means is 30 megawatt thermal input to it. So the 30 is it, and long story on how to get to 30 megawatts thermal, but anyway. And then we have a much smaller system that's, uh, that's an M, what we call an M12. So it's basically, you know, about a third of the size. And so the tra Okay, so could you conceptually build another train and decide to take in trash from another county? Could you decide to double your size of your facility and simply take product MSW statewide or triple your facility or quadruple your facility without our participation or knowledge or awareness? Uh, I, technically, yeah, without your knowledge is probably a little difficult. I mean, you know. I don't want to go too far down that rabbit trail, but, but you're a private company with a customer, one of which would be Rutherford County, yep. and you could choose to have other customers and scale up independent of... But abs could absolutely do that if that's what the county allowed us to do. At this point, again, we went in at that 85,000 tons, but at the end of the day, if, if the county says, look, again, the county controls 40,000, and we need another 40, and you say, look, Jeff, you're free to go, go find it yourself, then that's what I'll go do. Would, would you be agreeable to come back and ask permission for that from the county? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have any issues with it. My thought is, in this case, Republic does not have to have our permission to apply for another sale and take on trucks from 30 counties. What's the difference? Well, again, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going down a rabbit trail, but you're an independent company with a contract with us would be one of the scenarios. Yeah, that, yes, that, that, you're technically, I think you're right. You're, you're right. We would have a contract with the county. We're an independent company. But I don't think that's what we're trying to do here. I know, I know. And again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to st stop my question right there. Okay. And, and Along that same line, though, I mean, we're growing by 25, 26, 27, 28 people a day. So if the city is coming on and with the county and we're producing 85 thousand tons now as soon as you open up in two years you you're past capacity so you, there's a growth factor in there that okay now what we're we gonna do with the other stuff that that we've got that it's got to go somewhere so yeah you, you you're out of capacity by the time you get it built you know what I'm saying well, I think that's, you know, again, you're potentially right that we're out of capacity the day we build. And I think that's part of, you know, it's, e it's easy to say, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I do this a lot. And I talk to a lot of folks like yourselves all, all over the country. And it's easy to, to say, look, you know, this is what we're going to do and, and that's it. But, you know, I really look to, to be a little bit more collaborative than that, right? And that we all need to be on the same page as to what growth is going to look like and agree on a growth curve. What all the experts say is one thing, what we physically see is another. And, and forecast all this out and, and come to say, look, when we get to this point, you know, we need to look at that second train and what's the impact of doing that and, you know, when's the right time to do that. I don't believe that that is a decision that my company should make in a, you know, in a bubble. Right? Because I don't think that's right. That's not being a good, a good neighbor, if you will. We're here to solve a problem for the county. Try to solve a problem for the county. That's what I'm trying. That's what we're trying to do. And I could easily go find a piece of property, not easily, but I go find a piece of property and build, build one of these and hang my shingle out and go, hey, I'm merchant and take from anywhere and everywhere, Franklin, Spring Hill, wherever. It doesn't matter. But that's I don't have an interest in that. I have an interest in working with the county and solving the county's problem. And if that means that when we get done talking through this, that there's excess capacity in that facility, and there's a benefit to not just myself, but to the county to, to let others in, then we'll have that conversation and we'll figure that out. May I hear you say one more time, if I understood you correctly, our obligation to that facility as a county would be to supply the waste 
and tipping fees. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Long-term contract. Again, this thing is going to last 25 years. You know, so we look for 20-year contracts. And, and Commissioner Dodd, I don't know if you heard the question or not when I asked. So Jeff did say that he would be willing to include the um, addendum or a piece of the contract that says he would be required to come back or his team or this company would be required to come back and ask permission from Rutherford County to actually accept waste from other companies or certain amounts or he said they would be willing to include that. That kind of answers your, your question. Yes. All right, so a, a moment ago, you started down a path, I think you were going to get to simple clarity before we open the envelope. You said, consider you as a virtual landfill. You just about had me. I almost understood how to simp dumb this down for me. You're the virtual landfill. Take it from there. Can, can you? Well, how can I expand on that for you? So essentially... We dump it, we're done with it. We pay a tip and fee, we're done with it. You're done. There's, there's no just, market... At, there's at the gate, truck rolls in, we weigh it, dumps, into the, dumps onto the floor of the pit, right? We now take care in custody. That waste is now our problem. They own it now. We own it, essentially. And, and granted, the, the envelope's going to be critical because if you don't have power at the other end, the tipping fee goes up. If you have to haul it out of here, the tipping fee goes up. And I'm sure that's the, in, the, in the... You're not... Our price is set based on whether or not, you know, if, if something happens to our facility and I've got to divert that material for some reason, that's not a county problem, that's my problem. There's not a separate tip fee for that. You pay one number. Then I think we need to open this envelope so I can understand how to proceed from here. We need to see, this. we need talks pricing if that's available to us. Craig, I, I may have interrupted your train of thought. Let's go to Mac quick with a question from Mac. Not long ago, we had a little bit of ice fall around here. We didn't haul any trash for five days. So if we've got a commitment to you for so many tons a day, where I'm going with this question, I'll just come out and ask the question, how much storage capacity of fuel source do you have? How long can you run without another load being dumped? So normally we'll put somewhere between three and five days worth of storage in there. Um, you know, I, I'm, you're right, nothing moved for essentially a week, right? And those are, you know, essentially a, you know, acts of nature and none of us can control that and so understand that if that situation happened and we had to bring the system down it's not the end of the world you know we can actually idle the system leave it hot and then quickly bring it back up again this is not a system that takes two weeks to shut it down and two weeks to start it back up again um, it holds a lot of heat within it and so startups you know if we know that we're gonna you know we've got a three or four day interruption will we'll, we'll operationally deal with that. I don't see that as a huge, a huge challenge. I think that the, if there's a challenge to it, it's when you can start hauling again, all of a sudden you're gonna get four days worth of volume or five days worth of volume in a matter of a day or two, right? Or three, and to make sure that we have receiving capacity to account for that slug of material. That's probably a, a bigger consideration than I, I worry about whether, I, whether the gas fire has to get shut down for a day or something like that. The other thing, I think I read it, maybe I dreamed it, uh, y'all will be open when we're open? Yeah, I mean, essentially, you tell us what hours work. I mean, I, it, this gas fire runs 24-7, so, um, you know, there's going to be people at the facility 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our trucks run 24-7. Bring them on. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a question. I keep, a mayor keeps... He keeps nudging me. He wants to say something, so he, he's being very patient. Um, so, Jeff, let me ask you a question. It, it, whether, whether we pop the envelope and look at a price or not, my question is going to be related to a fee. 
if Rutherford County says, hey, we want to, or we partner with one of these others on the RFP list, say we want to take care of construction demolition or we want to take care of recyclables ourselves because yes yeah, sometimes there's a market for it sometimes not or maybe we think somebody else that wants to do the cardboard and uh, and compressed paper has a better deal or dangles a better carrot let's say do, does your deal change because i i know if you do the recyclables and you would benefit from if there is a profit you would benefit from that if we take that deal off the table does that change your dynamic and your proposal and your fee schedule uh it it does but not as much from the perspective of the value of the recyclables because we're not putting a lot of value on it anyway yeah the bigger issue for me is that when you start to pull out things like plastic and cardboard, it changes the overall energy content sure. of the feedstock. And so it may not change the throughput. We may still end up with the same volume of material, but I may not be able to make as much power either. Right. That makes so sense. So that's what's called the mass, our mass balance, our energy mass balance. And so, you know, what we've contemplated is what was provided. And if that feedstock characteristic changes because you want to bring in a different group to pull other recyclables out. I, I don't have an issue with that. It's just a matter of we're going to need to understand that before we can commit to, to any numbers at that point. I understand. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, would you like to ask a question or give a comment? Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, show interest um, in our waste stream for the next 25 years. We thank you for your submission. Um, we like doing business with local folks and it would be awesome if we could do business with uh, someone that lives here and Great. provides that. But as, as mayor, it's my job is to get down into the weeds a little bit and ask some technical questions and to all the questions that have been asked here today is to make sure that um, we protect the, the commission and the assets of this community, uh, so I uh, will probably thoroughly vet, our office will vet everything that's been discussed here today. Um, how many employees does um, Design This have? Two. Two? You and your wife? <laughs> that's it. Okay. So uh, when you sp speak of we... Uh, you're talking about your team. I guess those would be the engineers and all the other people that come from the other companies, uh, uh, Full Cycle, uh, Sonova, Correct. et cetera. So yep. that would create the team. You threw up a list of your references, um, and that's not on our SharePoint because that was probably on your flash drive that you, you put in. Um, are there contact names and numbers that, that, that we can vet? Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. Yeah. Look, we'll, we're we're willing to you know make an you know, make a request and okay. we'll give we, you the information. We just need to make those contacts with with all these different companies you're doing business with. Um, and uh, not saying that you're not telling us the truth, but but that's what we have to do. Uh, we just have to fully uh, expect it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so we'll do that. It's your. It, it's. Um, design this are you registered in this state or with the Tennessee Secretary of State's office yep Tennessee okay and <clears throat> so I hope you understand that in order for us to uh, bring you the type of of tonnage that was in the RFP it's going to take uh, we can't make that decision for all the other entities, the city of Murfreesboro, Smyrna, Eagleville, and Laverne. Uh, in order to um, pull them all together, we're going to have to discuss uh, the direction because they have to participate. In order to make any one of these that we're going to be interviewing, in order to, they're using the same numbers that you were provided. So in order to make anything, whether it be a state-of-the-art recycling, a gasification process, or state-of-the-art 
composting any type of facility when you're making that type of investment you base it on those numbers of the waste stream coming in you seem to be very knowledgeable in, in uh, your industry and and um, glad we have somebody that knows something out in Christiana is uh, we've every one of us in here have learned a lot about trash and uh, waste streams over the course of the RFI and the RFP um, but we're serious about it and we want to make sure that we choose the right partner uh, to do business with so um, can you can we keep that uh, flash drive with that information because we don't have that I have downloaded yes okay simple answer is yes we'll make sure you have a oh. copy of it okay I'll, I, if, if you don't mind, it's in PowerPoint now, so we'd want to save it as a PDF. But otherwise, yeah, I don't, I don't have an issue sharing that. Okay, not at all. Uh, uh, and anything that needs to be redacted or anything else, we we don't want to share There's that. Nothing just, in there that needs to be redacted. Yeah, I so just we're good. Want, we'll need to follow up and make contacts with these companies and and uh, talk with them as well. But uh, I sort of appreciate your knowledge and bringing all this forward to us tonight. I'm just curious that, that facility right there. What is what does that facility cost? What would be the cost of something like that? Uh, that's a little different. Just be well. I can give you a number, but I don't know it's going to help you equate it to here in the U.S. because things are labor and things in Thailand. It's are in a Thai lot dollars. Less expensive. <laughs> what is but, your if the one you want to build here? How much would that cost to build? I would say that if, if it stays at the 85,000 tons, I would tell you that the cost to build that the facility here in Rutherford County will be somewhere between, I'll give you a range, not a specific number, would be somewhere between 55 and $65 million. For the, for the 85,000 tons? Yes, as, as a range. Okay. All right. Don't so, hold me to it because there's still some sight and things that that affect all those numbers. But generally, I think, you know, that that's kind of where 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 a system like this would would cost. That's that's all, a. All of that cost is on your entity, not this one. I'm sorry. All of that cost is on your company and not the county. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a design, build, own, operate by our team. We're not asking the county to put up a penny I'm not I'm not gonna come to you and say I need you to write me a check for five million dollars I'm not gonna say I need a check for five dollars we're going to fund a hundred percent of this and that again that's your uh, liability not ours but that price is again you used a range that's land design construction it, it, is that your frame of reference? Is it's, a, it's an all-in number, of property, cost, okay. cost of capital, cost of finance, the project, the okay. lawyers, the, 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 the everybody. And that's the... It's a turnkey price. The two gasification components. It's MRF, two gasification components to generate fuel sufficient to run a turbine and generate electricity. Is that 55 to 65? That's... Yep. It, this facility here, was it a, in the vicinity of 85,000 tons a year? Yep. That one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a 55,000 square foot MRF, and so 47,000 square foot transfer, and well, it's well, very yep. similar to very similar. Okay. Yep, that's the same. The gasifier that's in this picture is what's called the M30. What we're going to use here is the M30. So the gasifier is exactly the same. The building might look a little different. The layout of the property might look a little bit different, but that is essentially what would be built. Is there here. a turbine and a electrical storage? unit facility in that drawing yeah, no electrical storage but there's yes there's yes. a turbine mm -hmm. yeah yep and yep. i don't know how electricity stores so that was a dumb question jeff on the uh slide that you had up i thought i noticed that the atlanta site had a 24 megawatt output i think that was so it two and a half times larger than our potential Georgia. So, so not to confuse things, and because we do it on a regular basis, and why they want us to do it this way, I don't know. I always talk about production from a megawatt perspective. From from Sonova's perspective, they size them on the megawatt thermal input. Okay. And so, if you look at the size where it says in megawatts, if you look after each one where it says 20 megawatts th, 
that's thermal. So that's the input into the system, not the output on the back end. All right. So that system uh, will obviously do less power than what a, f a full 30 would do. Okay, I, I'm with you. Ours is a 30. Yours is an M30 input, which just to give you rough numbers, assume it's a typical MSW, will generate about 10 megawatts of electricity gross. And so again, people, when it comes to electricity, people get confused sometimes. So that's the rated capacity of the turbines, which means every hour it makes 10 megawatts. So on a daily basis, we're generating 240 megawatt hours of electricity. Of that, 80% uh, essentially is exported to the grid. 20% is used to run the facility. Mr. Chairman, another great question that Becky's come up with that I'm going to read. But you, you had said the answer, I think, this uh, a little while ago back earlier about if if something happened then you know it's your trash we're taking it there and whatever something goes down in your facility and you're down so it's like how realistic how reliable is the backup plan for providing proposed services for an extended period of time you have something heaven forbid a, a, a tornado comes through and knocks over two or three things here uh, our trash is still coming probably more since a tornado came through so it's your puppy or is this something that's going to be tweaked in the legal ramifications of the drawing up the draft or, or the or the signing with the attorneys and everything is this still your trash we're bringing it seven days a week like Mac was saying yeah yeah look so the way that this whole thing is contemplated the simple answer to that is yes Okay. Once the lawyers get involved, obviously there's some nuances to that. But, you know, as you say that, if you get the trash, you got you. your responsibility yeah. is to get the trash across our scale. Yes. When it crosses that scale, that's my problem. Now, I'll, you know, full transparency, if a tornado comes through and knocks over the whole building, force majeure is going to kick in. And, you know, we're probably out of business for a long time. And that all needs to be dealt with in a contract. You know, what does that look like? Right? That's a that's the absolute worst case scenario in my opinion. We can scenario the, now, this the likelihood thing all night, but I just wanted, you know, yeah, maybe look, that wasn't the best one, but uh no, it's probably something not. happens and, and and you know, it's it's actually put in here for an extended period of time. Whatever happens, you know, something fails, it's not working correctly, the state shuts you down, whatever, I don't know. Uh something got clogged up and we can't get it fixed for a while or, or there's a part you know down or electronic control module goes out whatever all these different scenarios extended period of time our trash is still happening and so yeah we, we, we realize that like, when I, we don't live in a bubble we, we realize that the waste that we're dealing with whether it's msw whether it's biosolids there are certain waste streams that just come every day no matter what happens we've contemplated all of this right that 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 goes in hand in hand with having this technology vetted going through what's called HAZOPS, which identifies all the points of potential failure in the system. It includes making sure there's a significant amount of spare parts on the shelf. Like a facility like, like, like we contemplate here, this probably has $200,000 worth of spare parts sitting at the facility. You know, replacement relays, replacement temperature pros, replacement belts for conveyors. There's lots of replacement parts. We don't want it down any more than anybody else does because if it's down, then obviously it costs us money. It, it'll, I can tell you right now, if I have to take that waste and move it somewhere else, whether it's to ship it all the way up to Clarksville because I have an emergency contract with them to put it into the landfill, it's going to cost more than we're going to contract for with you guys. I, I can almost guarantee it. So let me piggyback on that and ask. We had, um, unfortunately, in March, we started the path with the COVID-19 pandemic. We had a huge increase in volume between April and May. Some of our facilities in Middle Tennessee had a 70% increase. So if all of a sudden you get 70% more waste on a given day or for a specific period of time, is that going to be something you can process or is that going to be something you're going to hold on to or is that going to be something you're going to put in a landfill? And this is just out of curiosity. Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. And so, again, the system is designed is going to be designed for whatever capacity we finally settle on amongst ourselves. 85,000, 40,000, 120,000, I don't care what the number is. That's what we designed for, okay? Based on processing 
310 days per year. Okay. I can tell you right off the bat, we'll have two weeks worth of planned outage. So that leaves, you know, some additional days of potential operation, you know, in case you have an unplanned outage, something along those lines. If we can run more, we can process more than we, agree, than we commit to. But unfortunately, if there's an, a sudden surge, we may not be able to take that surge of material. And you would expect Rutherford County to figure out a place to take that? Most likely. Or work together to come up with a solution. Okay. You know, we just, I just, I can't, I just don't know yet, but, you know, the way we would look at this is we're going to guarantee to take a minimum volume. And if we can take more than that minimum volume, we're happy to do it, but our obligation will be at whatever we both agree to. You're going to agree to deliver a minimum, we're going to agree to take a minimum, and beyond that, if there's excess, excess room, then we'll take it. Yes, sir. One second. I second. All right, we have a motion. <laughs> we have a motion and a second to uh, open the financial aspect of uh, design. This is uh, RFP. Any other discussion about that? Yeah, about we have a motion, and I'm, I would normally open that up for discussion before we vote. Is there any? Would there be any problem with us going ahead and open this up? I mean, everybody else has got their bids are locked in too. Yeah, I, I'm saying so there shouldn't be a problem. And I'm like everybody else. Yes, I'd like to know the cost here. But Becky, do you think there's a problem with us looking at this? cost before we look at all these processes I know you mentioned that a while ago Here, here's what I think we we went out with an RFP so that we could get feedback and we could get the systems that people would bring to Rutherford County to solve the solid waste issues that we've talked about for a couple of years now if we look at pricing and pricing becomes the sole reason that you're looking at and ultimately there is an economic decision to be made here but if you look at a price now and you go up uh, nope some of you all have seen things or heard things you like some of you all still have questions I know that but if you look at a price and you go oh well that's way too much or oh well that's you know that's good well these people are no longer on the table or these people are on the table all of a sudden have you then questioned prematurely questioned other technologies or other things that will come after this and we're going to go through some of these presentations up through I think it's the third week of May and and the purpose was to say okay let's talk about technology let's talk about options for the county and then and I had actually um, recommended that we spend one evening talking about the pricing to actually go back and look at pricing overall now now this is your prerogative you're welcome obviously welcome to do it how you want to and I'll, I'll follow your lead whatever you decide well I, I'm of course like everybody else interested in cost but I'm not like a kid waiting on Christmas here. I can I can <laughs> handle the anticipation for a while if if it made a difference on my thought process. But I, I think I'm also mature enough that it's not going to make a difference on my thought process knowing what his cost is versus his technology. Although I still got some more questions for him outside of cost. So I hope that's not the end of our meeting. Any uh, any questions? I I, ha I have a question or a thought. Um, Rachel brought up a good point. Chairman P said that he thinks he's mature enough not to let it interfere. I I am concerned about a financial bias that may that may be implanted in my brain or any of your brains that you see a price. And it may have a imprinted thought on how you view the rest of the RFPs. Now, I may see this price, and I still may not know what it means. And we'll have to have several discussions to break down what the price really means. Highly probable. But I, I just want you to know, personally, I'm a little bit concerned about letting price 
dictate our information gathering at this point. I, I, I'm afraid I, I might see something and my, I might skew it internally because of a, a price that I think is flashy. And I don't know that that's fair. That's just my thought. Uh, I, I, I want technology and engineering to be my opinion till the last minute. And then we decide on what we can afford. But that's just my thought. I just wanted to get that out there. So we have a, Becky, do you have any other thing to say? I, I just was gonna say, we've, we've talked about decisions made in the past. Um, those decisions were made with the very best of the ability of the elected officials then based on the information they had. Free disposal is very um, intriguing, it's very exciting, and it's, it's something you wanna hope you hold on to forever. But there's a balance here somewhere. I, I think, um, I'm not sure you'll find free disposal. I don't, I, I don't see that in anything we have. Um, I, I just think you have to take all of the information you have and make some decisions based on what you have now and then look at price. And, but again, it's, it's your decision if you prefer that we wait. I mean, if you prefer that we go ahead and open them instead of wait, I'm good with that. I, I don't have them with me tonight. I'll defer to maybe someone in the mayor's office. They've, they've got the originals. If we need to go and get those tonight. Um. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Do we intend to bring this gentleman back for another presentation? Or is this it? Uh, Steve, my, my thought on that is if, if any RFP candidate kind of makes the, let's say, the final four, then if it's Jeff, he and whoever else is in our top hierarchy would yes come back and not only present to us but to present to full commission perhaps all the other city mayor yeah city mayor stakeholders whoever wants to listen would be my thought I'm not saying it's that's the right decision but that's my thought my thoughts on this if we don't open the price tonight with the presentation by the time we go through nine, we'll be so confused that when we get the price, now what was that for? Now what did they do? What are we going to get for that money? I, I, I think we're all mature enough to hear the price. A lot of us are in business, and it not affect your decision. It's going to be dollars and cents pretty close down on the end goal line anyway. You know, you probably can't give... 200 million for some technology that really rung your bell when you could do it for a lot less somehow. I'm done. My, my, last, my last comment, I promise, is Jeff's deal right now is pretty clean. It's a turnkey deal. I mean, they're paying for everything. All we're doing is bringing waste and then there's a tipping fee, which is pretty easy to understand. Others are, a lot of these are P3 issues, public-private, where we're going to be involved financially as other partners. So when we, and I'm a guy that looked, has looked at quotes on materials and things his whole life. So when I see a price, or when we see a price, the first question is, okay, here's a price, and how does it compare, compared to what? Well, his deal's turnkey. The next one's going to be we're partnered with private-public partnership, and his is a whole deal. Others are going to be, well, we're pulling out recyclables, we're doing mulch, we're doing something. So in my mind, I look at prices and I think, okay, this, 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 and this. How do I compare them right now? without hearing the rest of the technologies. I, I, I just think I'm going to have a hard time understanding how the prices all gel in a comparable fashion. But that's just me. I'm, I'm a little slow. So we have a motion. Um, you've heard, and we have a second. We've heard opinions. Uh, Becky, if you'll do a roll call. I'm sorry. I mean, the, the, I'm the, sorry. Rachel, the, Wayne, I'm Wayne sorry. Had I had a comment. Cut, yeah. I cut you off. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, Rachel, not Becky. If you'll do, <laughs> if you'll do roll call. That's how we usually right. sit opposite. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're getting ready to call the roll on the motion. Yes. I, I, you can either vote yes to uh, or no. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Or vote no to not. Yeah. Uh, Craig, do you have any opinions on opening these tonight in this discussion? Is it is it critical? To well, here's the thing. He's got a Mercedes. I like it. Can I afford it? I mean, I think I have no problem with listening to this gentleman. I have no problem not seeing the bids. But, I mean, we have to eventually see it. I mean, if we're going to you know, take something very serious, we need to know how much it's going to cost. If we're going to take this serious, then we have to see what it's going to cost us. I understand where you're coming from, Commission, uh, mm -hmm. Chairman Cush, but we got to open them eventually. Will it will it disadvantage the other parties if we know the number now? No, because they're, anyway? they're, so, they're all sealed. They're in a sealed mayonnaise jar downstairs. Somewhere. No, they're locked in, right? Correct. They're locked in, so I get that. I guess it's that you answer that. It it would it, it would be an individual. Okay. When we received these, I felt like we should have had the price then, but I understood why we didn't. But at this point, we're we're in a transparent period with public viewing, and uh, an amazing presentation. Uh, I like what I hear, but I also want to see what it looks like, dollars and figures. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 one second. I did lie to you. I have one more thing. I have one more thing. If we see, see a price tonight or tomorrow morning, whatever the case may be, and we start seeing prices after every presentation, that's a price written on paper. Well, I'm in sales. Some of you guys are in sales. We like to negotiate. That may not be their final price. We may, as a group, say, you know, we like you, but we need you to cut a nickel off, and here's why. We're going to participate in this. Or we'll donate something. We'll give you the land. So I'm just saying that whatever number we see may not be the last number we do. There may be some horse trading. And your final Chairman, forward. That has to happen after the fact. Well, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. You might see a number, and I don't want you biasedly saying, well, those guys are too high. I'm scratching. I'm, they're scratched, in my opinion. And we haven't had a chance to sit down and say, well, I like you, but you're too high. What are you going to do? Uh, in, that's, your, that's in your final four will be where your ne negotiations will take place. But that's right. But if you ha if you if you biasly cut somebody because you think their price is too high and they don't make the final four, then all hope is lost. So I don't think you can. I don't think it operates that way. I think you make a selection at the end of the day, and then if you want to negotiate with the entity that you selected, but I don't think you can select a final four and negotiate between the four of them. You have to go with the price that they submitted. You pick somebody, and then you go. Is that not the case? Well, it's kind of gray. I mean, these aren't hard. These aren't hard bids. I thought they were. Does it say that these are hard bids, Becky? Proposed. Proposed pricing. Yeah. I mean, I'm, if they give me a price and then we say, we like you, but that was just a proposed price. Uh, really, we meant for it to be this much. So in my heart, this this is a hard bid. I, I just, now, if we want to negotiate after we select someone, that's, that's a different story to me. But uh, these... In my heart, these are these are good faith numbers that they're presenting. Yeah, and it may, maybe I did a poor job explaining. If you, I guess my thought is, it, when we see a number on paper, I'm not necessarily convinced. At the end of the day, if you're sitting at the end of the table and say you're our number one horse, that that whatever that number is that was on the paper that we open tonight or this month will be the final number that we've all agreed upon. 
Th that's what I'm saying. And, and, and I, don't, I don't want a number we open tonight or this month to say, whoa, too high. Scra scratch. Okay. Uh, it's, I just, I gotta, as chairman, I've got to throw out all the possibilities. Anything else? Are we good? Are we ready? We've got a motion and we've got a second. All the questions. All the question. All right. Rachel, thank you. Mr. Piercy? Yes. Mr. Pay? Yes. Mr. Dodd? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Blair? Yes. Mr. Serenio? Yes. Chairman Cush. Uh, no. <laughs> we will let you leave the room. <laughs> I'm going to be tarnished, I know. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yes, sir, Mr. P. I Motion passes, yes. I assume that she's gone after that bid and will be a minute. We've got a minute to ask yes, sir. a couple other questions. Ask away. Okay, we had like 14 criteria we asked people to bid on. I noticed you, your name under three of them, and education was one, processing, and then uh, residential municipal waste. And I think you've done a pretty good job on your processing, and I guess the residential waste, that's basically what you're taking in from us. Correct. But Correct. what about the education part of it? Is that part of the tipping fee we'd be paying, and what would you be doing? Yeah, so typically what I've done on facilities like this before is use, use the system as, as an educational tool. And so get the local schools involved, get the local universities involved, you know, and use it as a way to really start to promote and educate, you know, a different form of recycling. Because at the end of the day, we are recycling, right? We're just doing it in a different manner. And so, you know, we like, you know, we, we like to put together a program that invites, you know, invites the schools and, and community in to understand and learn what we're doing. All right, and two, I got more out of out of this is, is what expectations do you have for Rutherford County to do? Now, one is we're going to have to transport all our waste to you. Once we get it to you, you know, of course, there's cost involved in us maintaining our convenience centers or curbside pickup or whatever we do, we got to get it to you. Now, I understand that simply enough, and then you're taking it from there, but are there any other expectations besides, you know, possibly volume that you have for the, from the county? Yes, yeah, so I think what we, we said was, you know, we're really looking for the county's help in putting this on the right piece of property, whether that, you know, if it's not at that wastewater treatment plant, if it's a piece of property the county owns, um, you know, we're looking for you know, involvement from the county to, to, to source that right piece of property. What makes it the right piece? Um, you know, usually it's going to be, you know, good ingress and egress, not adjacent to a neighborhood. <laughs> um, although, no matter where we put it these days, a neighborhood could pop up in the next few years. Um, you know, access to the power lines, you know, access to the, to the road system, right? If you're hauling in from all over the county, you know, there's a convenience center two miles from where I live down in Christiana, and I know that stuff gets got to get picked up and moved. So, you want it to, you know, want it a location that's easy for those, you know, those trucks to get in and out and not spend half a day getting there and getting out again. So, you know, it's the size of the piece of property. If, as an example, we want to contemplate, you know, expansion of the facility in year five, year ten, year fifteen, to make sure that the piece of property is big enough to support, you know, a, a, an expansion. It's not just the facility; it's got more trucks at that point and other things. So. You know, we don't own property. You know, we don't own property here. Um, you know, we'll have to source property, and I think I think it's a reasonable expectation to say we should do that side shoulder to shoulder with the county. Have you proposed one of these to anybody in the U.S. that is up and functionable today? No. No. There's none operational in the U.S. today. There are systems in California that are under development further along than this process. Um, we're starting, a, uh, starting the development of a project in Virginia, which is identical to this. Um, it's MSW. It's actually with a hauler, an a actual company, a, a family-owned business. Um, the Georgia facility is, is the one that's in construction. Can you draw a picture? <laughs> um, but this technology 
really started to come to market about three years ago and it takes a lot of time to get these projects developed and get them moving I widen my question is there any of these in production today in the world yes yeah, so we can take you we can go we can, we can go to the Netherlands and see the demonstration scale pro, uh, gasifiers there they're identical to what we would build just bigger but there's not a full-scale plant of this particular size <laughs> today no thank you there's not uh, Rachel, Rachel has asked to, for one of you to make a motion for a Netherlands road trip for her and her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> see. Yeah. But Yo. can, I, can I just further on my response to that question? And so we recognize, and I've been doing this, you know, trying trying to develop in some aspects cell gasifiers for 15 years, and. You know, the one thing that I learned a long time ago is that while gasification has been around, it was first developed 200 years ago. It's been around a very long time. The first coal power power, the first coal powered power plants in a lot of cases were gasification. But, you know, that hasn't kind of trickled into mainstream. And I have found that going to a municipal entity, whether it's a county, a city, a waste authority, um, and ask them to put a significant amount of capital into something that is not necessarily viewed as mainstream technology yet is a very difficult proposition. And so we could have easily said, here's our system, Rutherford County, pay me 60 whatever number, and you own it. But I also know that that's probably not going to work because municipalities are not designed to take any kind of technical risk. And so that's why we're coming to the table saying, we'll fund, we'll fund it and not ask the county to put, take any risk. Okay, Jeff, uh, uh, no surprise. I, I probably need a little explanation I'm on. sorry, Chairman. Does Jeff need to take a break? He's been on his feet for two and a half hours. You, you need, need, you need a cup of water or a bottle of water? Okay. I, got, I got water right there. I can grab it real quick. All Go right, ahead. So you, you, have a cop, you do have a copy of this? All right. Will you, will you explain what this electricity tariff means? Sure. What that essentially means is the price that we're going to get paid for the power. So, and I will, since it's open, I'll tell you where two cents is. That's TVA. TVA has a program that any of these systems that are under 80 megawatts, you can export it all to TVA and they will happily pay you two cents a kilowatt for the power. And so that's where that number is driven from. So you can see the sensitivity of the tip fee based on power. So pricing. in what in what scenario does that tariff bump up to six cents? Or so that would cents? be what we would consider a behind the meter application. So we're offsetting somebody's retail power price. So a behind the fence kind of a behind thing. Behind the fence. So, you know, I don't know, I, I think all of us are probably paying about the same price for power at home. So, you know, about nine point nine cents, call it ten cents. And so we're basically saying we're gonna we're going to sell this power to a wastewater treatment plant that's paying 10 cents and we'll sell it to them for six cents so they save a little bit of money and then that drives the tip fee the tip fee down so we're under the retail price which is why co-location with a user behind the fence if you will or behind the meter however you want to phrase it is uh, in the selection of a piece of property is pretty key and this is not something that's unique to here in Rutherford County. Pricing is a little different, but um, it's the same conversation everywhere I go, except California, because they're willing to just pay ridiculous amounts for power, and um, and they have and they're forced to do it. So, but we're not there. So we stopped at option three. I could have kept going, um, but now we're bumping up against retail price of power, and you know I don't see anybody paying retail price or more than retail price, but that's the sensitivity around around the pricing. We pay this disposal fee, then we pay the electricity tariff. The county does not. Only if the county is the purchaser of the power. 
So if we wanted to, to use this technology to power one of our schools, we'd have to buy the power from you? Yes. And, and Craig, if you and I recall, we TVA visited with us right. for, uh, two, three years ago. And so I think we have to look at this. That power's not selling. That power's not selling. The power's not going to be, not going to grant us a discount. Or I think we have to go into it with that thought. We're, we're, we have the luxury of living in a TVA community. And so we're going to spend the upper numbers here. Just is, is my frame of reference. I think that's where you have to start your mental process. It, you know, unless the unless the Chamber of Commerce can convince a a Amazon or somebody like that coming in to sign up with us for the power, and you build this facility, or at least transmit the power to them. At, at, well, and well, let me let me scratch that because they would probably have a deal with TVA that'd be cheaper than what we would sell to them for anyway. Yeah, that, yeah. We, that was really pounded into us when we met with them. They were very candid. I, I appreciated it. Yeah. Uh, who uh, the, the eight kilowatts is your production uh, potential? Does that does that am I? So uh, with this eighty-five thousand to generate the power, who? What would what does the power plant use per year, or, or how much do they use versus how much would an eighty-five thousand ton gasification yeah, produce? So general numbers: the plant will gross generate ten megawatts, so ten thousand kW. Or what, over what period of time? I'm sorry, dumb it down. So per day or per year? What? So so when we talk about production, it's on the hour. Okay, so that this will be a 10 megawatt, 10,000 kilowatt rated system. So that means every hour it produces that as a gross number. When we subtract out the parasitic load for the plant, so to run all the pumps and motors and computers and everything else, we end up with about eight to export. Floats around in there, but it'll average out somewhere around eight, depending on how that, how that how, per hour. So you take that eight or that 8,000, multiply it by 24, that's your daily production that you would deliver to the grid, multiply that by 310 days a year, that gives you your annual number. How much uh, power would the Murfreesboro water sewer plant use? Uh, I don't, have the, I don't use? have the exact numbers, and, and, uh, but I would tell you just based on what I do know about that plant, I would tell you at best they'll probably use half. So this, you know, this pricing structure, and, and this is, and I don't remember exactly who asked the question, but kind of all the things that need to get done to a contract, right? And so this gets flushed out before we get to the contract, right? If it says, if they, if, if, if this, if this body says, look, you're it, Jeff, you know, I honestly don't want to sell power for two cents. It doesn't make any sense to me to do that. And so, you know, before we lock in, we're going to go look for in earnest and hard at it, go look for that off taker that's going to drive this power price as high as we can get it. You know, six cents, I think it's, it's reasonable. You know, it, it's hard to go have these conversations with Nissan or, you know, or Bridgestone or some of these others, you know, on a theoretical project. I've, I met with Bridgestone not too long ago and, you know, about some tire things and whatnot. And it's just until you have a real project, it's hard to get some of these big corporations to sit down and actually talk to you and try to negotiate a price. And so, you know, what I would expect is, you know, if we were selected, you know, we're going to go out and get the best price we can for the power so that we can drive down the tip fee. I just don't want to come in here going, look, it's 100 bucks. I don't care if I get two cents. I'll just sit on two cents because it's easy to do. Two cents isn't that easy to do. You still have to go deal with TVA and get through their process. The easier deal would be to find a behind the meter, behind the fence type of offtake. It would be a much simpler process. So, very high level question to Mac. This this tipping fee here would be in addition to your current budget. You're correct. That's that's true of any tipping fee that we see. Yeah, I, I recognize the number. I mean, I know what I pay. <laughs> I'm here in the county, so it's not it's not a freaky number. I, I, yeah, good. I'm it is what, yeah, yeah, that. That, that, <laughs> it's right in my projected anticipation, frankly.
You're good. Anybody else? Can I ask a question? Jeff, you may. So now that these are open, has this become public information? The other bidders' numbers aren't public yet? Uh, I guess that would be the truth, other than the fact that the other bidders' numbers are still sealed and will be opened one at a time starting again tomorrow and at our next several meetings. But these numbers are now on the street. Well, I, 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 the, I would... we. We have an attorney here. Uh, it may be he may be he, it may not be appropriate depending on who he's represented. But I'm curious if we, these things are public now, y'all. Is my opinion. Yeah, I, I, this is a public hearing with the work, so you can assume Jeff they're public. You might should have asked that previously if if that was a a concern of I yours. Just, I figured as much. I just wanted okay. to make sure we were. Yeah, we were, and we were and maybe to. Uh, let's we'll chat about that in a little minute. And I've thus far not shared numbers for that very. To be cautious, I hadn't. Yeah. Um, articulated the number. I, I will say though, to there there is a escape clause a little bit for Jeff and for all those other RFP listeners. The last line of this says this cost proposal is valid for three months after date of submission and subject to change. So. If, if anybody's taking notes at home, like a competitor, uh, this this number may not do you any good in a few weeks. So, all right, gentlemen, last chance for a while to talk to Jeff. Jeff, this has been very interesting. I, I learned a lot of things tonight, uh, and I appreciate uh, all that you've done and uh, all the questions that you were able to answer. You were very thorough. And uh, I really appreciate the fact that you're a local uh, resident. Um, and uh, I, I wish you luck on, on this and other projects that you have in the US and the world. Um, all this fascinates me and I'm a huge fan of taking waste and making something usable out of it like energy um, so I applaud you for that so if there's nothing else uh, Jeff you are dismissed uh, and we will we will keep your number how about that <laughs> do, do that and like I said you know the last comment for me I guess is that you know if we don't if our group doesn't make the top four um, I'm a resource yeah I'm yep. here I have a vested interest in the county and so you know um, I'm, I'm here. Use, we, yeah, use, we, use me if you use me if you can. If it doesn't create conflicts, I'm here. I do this around the world, and um, that's great. You know, so feel free to reach well, out. We, we may lean on your knowledge for sure. Yeah. Thank you for that uh, opportunity. Yeah. All right, committee. Uh, anything else that you'd like to chat about, Becky? You want to give us a highlight of what's going on tomorrow? I'm, I've got a question for you all. So, so Jeff brought a presentation. Um, if for no other reason than the technology piece, and now you understand why I wasn't the person to explain it. <laughs> um, there are two proposals tomorrow night. One is Rockwood Sustainable Solutions out of Lebanon, Tennessee. The other is Waste Away, which is a facility most of you all have seen. Um, they're down in Warren County. So do you all prefer a PowerPoint presentation that I present? Do you all prefer just the narrative and I go over the high points and then the question and answer session starts? And this may, you know, Chairman, tell me if this is inappropriate, but I want to make sure that we get them the information they want or that they need in the in the way they want it. They being the committee. The committee, yes. Sir. Um, you know, you, tonight's setup, you had a three slide that looked like highly technical which I don't know that it to me it really didn't do much good because Jeff went over it uh, anyway I, I think if you just gave a one minute summary of of an overview of what their column of processes or education or transportation what what they are proposing uh, in, in introduction of the personnel that will be here tomorrow night uh, and I think we just let them go right Okay. To to the 
in a, if I'm assuming they will have a presentation that they will bring. We haven't we haven't told them to, but I'm glad to reach out to them. Um, most of them have something they've shown other places. Okay, so. they're certainly welcome to do that. Let if they know. just want to stand up and do a Q and A, that's fine too. But uh, we've all read their proposal, and uh, we'll be we'll be ready to go. And the narratives should be Rachel should have sent the narratives for tomorrow night as well. Did, Did you do this fact, one for Rachel? design this? Did you send the narratives? Yeah. Okay. You did this one. This is the design this narrative. Sure. You did that and yeah. you have one prepared for every... I do. That's all I need. Okay. okay. Everybody good? See you tomorrow night, 530. Appreciate your attendance. Good to see you, Robert. Thank you, Mayor.